appealing to order. Uh, in order to provide our technical and digital staff with notice of the hearing's start, I'm going to count down from five before calling, officially calling the hearing to order. Five, four, three, two, uh, the hearing is once again officially called to order. The subcommittee on Mr. Mr. Chairman, if you'd just suspend for a moment, we're we're waiting to get the sound in the in the room. No. Can I ask if, can I ask um, Ms. Blunt Rochester to do a mic check? Lisa, would you just, you know, do one, count from one to ten? Which, which Lisa? Lisa? Can you hear me, Lisa? We just wanted you to do a mic check from, just count from one to 10. Which Lisa? Chairman? Oh, I'm sorry, Lisa Blunt Rochester. Okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Okay, and, Can you hear me? and who else did you want to try? Chairman Rush, can you try it again with a mic check? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, Okay, four. we appear to be good. We're good? Yep, thank you. So we want him to start? Okay. 
All right, so go ahead, um, Bobby, you can begin. All right. Well, let's go back from the beginning uh, in order to provide our technical and digital staff with notice of the hearing start. I'm going to count down from five before calling the hearing to order. Five, four, three, two, one. The hearing is now called, or called to order. The subcommittee on energy will now come to order. Today, the subcommittee is holding a hearing entitled The Changing Energy Landscape Oversight of FERC. Due to the COVID-19 public health emergency, members can participate in today's hearing either in person or remotely via online video conferencing. Members who are not vaccinated and participate in person must wear a mask and be socially distant. Such members may remove their mask when they are under recognition and are speaking from a microphone. Staff and press who are not vaccinated and present in the committee room must wear a mask at all times and means socially distant. For members participating remotely, your microphone will be set on mute for the purpose of eliminating inadvertent background noise. Members participating remotely will need to unmute your microphone each time that you wish to be recognized. Please note that once you unmute your microphone, anything that is said in Webex will be heard over the loudspeaker in the committee room and subject to be heard by the live stream and also by the omnipresent C-SPAN. Since members are participating from different locations, locations at today's hearing, all recognition of members, such as for questioning, will be in the order of the full committee uh, seniority. Documents for the record can be sent to Lena Tina Martinez and the email address that we provided to each of your staff. All documents will be entered into the record at the conclusion of the hearing. The chair will now recognize himself for five for the purposes of an opening statement. Again, I would say good morning to each and every one of you. Today, the subcommittee on energy convenes to continue our work in establishing a path forward to achieve net zero greenhouse gas pollution and combat climate change. In order to achieve these important missions, it is critical that the federal government harnesses to its fullest extent all of its vast capabilities. In addition to this, as the energy landscape continues to change and to grow, it is vital that the Congress and the Biden administration and future administration works closely together. It is for these reasons that I am so delighted, so pleased to have uh, first before the subcommittee on energy today. Before I begin, though, I want to take a moment to publicly congratulate uh, Chair Chairman Glick on your being named Chairman of FERC uh, this past January. I certainly enjoyed the opportunity to meet with you at the beginning of your tenure and to look forward to our continued and productive partnership. Also, Chairman Chatterjee, I believe that this may be your last hearing before the, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner Chatterjee, uh, these incident promotions are not applicable here. Uh, Commissioner Chatterjee, I believe that this may be your last hearing 
reform the committee uh, during your tenure. I want to thank you for your outstanding years of public service, and I want to wish you well uh, as uh, your uh, time at Turk uh, is being concluded. I also want to take a moment, if I might, to congratulate uh, my senior staff on this subcommittee, um, uh, Jordan Lewis. This is her last hearing. She's going on to higher heights, to better environments, and to a more profitable uh, experience. She's going to work uh, at the Gates Foundation in a very important capacity. And I want to thank uh, Jordan for her, uh, not only her tenure as the senior legislative person uh, on energy in my office and on this subcommittee, but her outstanding public service that goes all the way, all the way back to the Department of Energy. Wouldn't you please just join with me and give me uh, Jordan a round of applause for her outstanding work. Thank you, Jordan, for your uh, outstanding work and your continued uh, commitment to our nation's future. It is well known that the electricity sector is one of the largest sources of greenhouse gas pollution within the United States. Further, the sector has had a disproportionate impact on health, environments, and causes uh, of historically marginalized uh, communities, the ecosystem of these uh, marginalized communities. Although it is not traditionally viewed as a climate regulator, first mass authority over the electricity sector makes it a principal player in our race to tackle climate change. As we know, FERC regulates critical elements of the U.S. Uh, energy industry and its system. This includes the transmission and the wholesale purchase of electricity, the transport of natural gas, and the permitting of a variety of energy infrastructure projects. Uh, I want to just uh, want also say that FERC is also the key to creation of a 21st century grid, which we need to reduce electricity costs all uh, while delivering reliable clean energy to consumers. Uh, Chairman Glick, I congratulate you on taking long awaited steps to make grid reforms that will support zero carbon electricity. My time is expired, and now I want to recognize uh, my good friend from the great state of Michigan, the ranking member of the subcommittee, uh, Mr. Upton, for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. Well, thank you, my friend, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses today for appearing. And welcome back, Chairman Glick. It's nice to have you testify again, but this time as chairman of FERC. Special welcome to the Energy and Commerce Committee, to Commissioners Clements, Christie. We look forward to working with each of you as members of this committee, uh, con conduct oversight of FERC, and work to strengthen and modernize our nation's energy infrastructure, and of course, our good friend Mr. Chatterjee uh, as well. You know, FERC is a small agency, but such an important mission. FERC is also unique in several ways. It's organized as an independent agency comprised of a bipartisan commission. FERC is funded primarily through user fees and annual charges paid by regulated energy companies. And importantly, FERC's responsibilities are limited by the statutes that's passed by us, the Congress. FERC's primary responsibilities include regulation of transmission and sale of electricity, oil, and natural gas in interstate commerce. They also review proposals to build interstate natural gas pipelines, LNG facilities, and non-federal hydro projects. At the same time, the electricity sector is also undergoing a dramatic transformation. A mix of federal, state, and market changes are driving our traditional baseload energy. We know that, notably coal and nuclear. While weather-dependent renewables 
take their place. These trends are contributing to reliability challenges, balancing load, and meeting peak demand as seen in California as well as in Texas. So FERC's authority is limited to the bulk power system for electricity and interstate commerce, but they are obligated to ensure that regional markets are benefiting consumers. As FERC turns its attention to the transmission planning process, I will certainly be paying close attention to how the costs of transmission projects are allocated to the taxpayers. Simply put, rural ratepayers should not be forced to subsidize transmission lines or sacrifice 24 seven grid reliability in order to connect renewable projects to big cities. And when considering new transmission, FERC should not be picking winners among renewable developers while sacrificing reliability and cost. Given the importance of FERC's established responsibilities and with limited time and agency resources to expand, concerns have also been raised about what appears to be a shift in FERC policy to align with President Biden's social justice and environmental programs. Under his leadership, FERC has begun to move the goalposts on environmental reviews, revive regs for electric uh, transmission in regional electricity markets to support wind and solar projects at the expense of cheaper and more reliable options and encourage lawsuits and legal challenges to new infrastructure projects. So with that, I look forward to today, today's hearing. Uh, there's much to consider given the changing landscape and I would yield back the balance of my time. Chair, Chair, thanks you. Welcome for you, man. You only make the balance of his time. The Chair now recognizes Mr. Pallone, the Chairman of the Full Committee for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Rush. FERC plays a critical role in ensuring the safe, reliable, and affordable delivery of energy to American homes and businesses, and I'm pleased to welcome all the current FERC commissioners to this oversight hearing. And I want to congratulate uh, Chairman Glick on his appointment by uh, President Biden and look forward to speaking with you about the commission's priorities for the coming year. And I also wanted to recognize Commissioner Chatterjee, whose term on the commission recently expired, but I know you're still here, but the term <laughs> expired. Although policy uh, differences, we found common ground on several important issues, and I thank you for your service. Recent extreme weather events in Texas, California, and the Pacific Northwest dramatically illustrate that the climate crisis is here and only will get worse if we don't act. And that's why Chairman Rush Tonko and I introduced the Clean Future Act to get us to 100% clean economy no later than 2050 and to make our electric grid more resilient to extreme weather. FERC has a large role to play in achieving this clean energy future and maintaining the reliable operation of our nation's grid. And as we heard at our transmission legislative hearing several weeks ago, reforming the transmission planning, siting, and cost allocation processes are critical to ensuring we can move renewable power from our wind and solar corridors to major population and industrial centers. So I want to commend FERC for its recent announcement of a joint task force with the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners. This is an effort to resolve the tensions between FERC and state regulators that too often interfere with the responsible deployment of more transmission. I'm also interested to hear more about the Commission's recent advance notice of proposed rulemaking on transmission and interconnection issues. In particular, I want to hear how FERC plans to pursue transmission policies that promote transmission development while also protecting ratepayers. And FERC, of course, also regulates the certification and siting of natural gas pipelines. Two of the biggest challenges we face in this area have to do with protecting landowner rights and accounting for greenhouse gas emissions. And fortunately, I believe FERC has made some much needed progress in these areas as well. On the eminent domain issue, FERC recently issued guidance protecting landowner interests during natural gas pipeline siting proceedings, and that was a good start but the Gas Act needs to better reflect today's realities and balance development with state and landowner rights. I hope FERC does more to address the appropriate scope of pipeline's eminent domain authority, as well as whether it should permit pipeline companies to demonstrate a market need for a new pipeline by signing gas supply contracts with their own affiliates. 
With respect to the greenhouse gas emissions during our 2019 hearing with FERC, I expressed disappointment about FERC's failure to account for greenhouse gas emissions in the pipeline review process. And earlier this year, for the first time, FERC assessed the significance of a project's greenhouse gas emissions and contributions to climate change, and that again was a welcome step forward. I also wanted to mention two other promising FERC actions. First, this year after a, a long wait, FERC committed to establishing an Office of Public Participation. The public, and in particular members of underrepresented communities, must have the opportunity and ability to participate in commission proceedings. So I'm pleased that FERC finally acted to establish that office, and I'm committed to ensuring that FERC makes this office an effective resource for environmental justice leaders, tribes, landowners, consumer advocates, and other members of the public. And second, I want to congratulate Montina Cole, who Chairman Glick appointed to be the Commission's first senior counselor uh, for, or senior counsel, I should say, for environmental justice and equity. For too long, regulators have overlooked the environmental justice and equity concerns associated with citing new natural gas pipelines, as well as hydroelectric licenses and other projects. So this is an important step to ensure that these concerns are no longer ignored. So thank you again for joining us today. Look forward to your testimony as we work together and our path forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The Chairman yields back. Uh, the Chairman now the ranking member of the full committee, Ms. McMorris, rises for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me also welcome the commissioners today. Since our last hearing in 2019, we now have three new commissioners, a departing commissioner, Chatterjee, and Mr. Glick has now been confirmed as chairman. Congratulations. This shifting leadership makes our oversight especially useful and timely today. How FERC executes its mission can have profound impacts on the price of energy and our security, also the ability of utilities to provide affordable and reliable energy and power to people. We cannot forget this as we examine the Commission's activities in the agenda today, and as we examine proposed energy and environmental policies here in Congress. What really matters is that we make sure policies work for people, to protect our way of life, to protect our standard of living. We must make sure that our federal laws and policies enable, not undermine access to affordable and reliable energy. This is necessary for a prosperous society, for the energy to innovate, keep costs low, and support jobs. It's essential for assuring public health and safety. Heart-wrenching examples, when the power goes out or the fuel stop flowing, have proved the point in California, Texas, the East Coast, and even in my district in Spokane. We all agree in the importance of clean energy solutions, but not as a substitute for the affordable energy that keeps the lights on. Across the nation, state and federal environmental and regulatory policies are undermining affordable, reliable energy. State renewable energy mandates and certain existing electricity market structures are driving out traditional baseload generation and harming people. And uh, as officials, uh, uh, and official assessments indicate, we're witnessing an electricity reliability crisis unfold across the country. In May, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation's summer reliability assessment confirmed what California grid operators were also reporting, that the state remained at risk of energy emergencies during normal summer demand and high risk if weather events cause above normal demand across the West. Texas and Louisiana, the upper Midwest, and New England are also at risk if a major weather event drives up power demand, according to the report. What will happen if current unreliability trends continue? What happens when more baseload generation and clean nuclear is shuttered? What happens when regions have no choice but to rely on weather-dependent wind and solar transmitted from other regions? What happens if the rush to green and the Green New Deal socialist agenda effectively nationalizes expensive California-style mandates on the rest of the country? 
We've discussed in many hearings how certain measures of the Clean Future Act would nationalize decarbonization goals, regardless of cost or reliance on China. Federal clean energy man mandates will drive out American energy, raising costs on low and middle income workers and undermining our economic opportunities. Mandating questionable electricity market structures will take control and accountability away from states, whether states or communities like it or not. And none of this stops the left from depriving states and communities of reliable, affordable energy. It won't relieve radical efforts to erase the benefits of firm, dispatchable energy, even in Washington state. There continues to be extreme efforts to dismantle the four lower Snake River dams, so important to clean, renewable, reliable, affordable electricity. FERC may not have any say in what Congress or the states do, but there is no question it must properly deal with the harsh consequences of policies that will make us dependent upon China and take America back to the dark ages. As regulatory oversight and decision making will help shape the kind of energy systems we have in the future. What matters today is will FERC focus on its core mission so the reliable, affordable delivery of energy and power remains the highest priority? Will the hardworking men and women of this country be central in its policies? Or will the environmental agendas that threaten to fail our most basic energy needs prevail? I look forward to our discussion today. With that, I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. Uh, the chair would like to remind members that pursuant to committee rules, all members' written opening statement shall be made part of the record. And we have now concluded uh, the members' opening statements, and we will now move to uh, uh, recognition of our witnesses for today. I would like to welcome each one of our witnesses for today's hearing. And they are the Honorable Richard Glick, who's the chairman of FERC, the Honorable Neil Chatterjee, who's the, who's the commissioner of FERC, the Honorable James Danley, who's also a commissioner at FERC. Another commissioner at FERC is the Honorable Allison Clements. And last but not least, uh, our last commissioner of FERC is Commissioner Mark C. Christie. We want to thank each and every one of you once again for joining with us today. And we look forward to your testimony. And this time, the chair will recognize each of you for five minutes to provide opening statements. Before we begin, though, I would like to explain the lighting system. In front of our witnesses is a series of lights. You already know this, but I have to say it anyway. The light will initially be green. The light will turn yellow when you have one minute remaining. Please begin to wrap up your testimony at that point. The light will turn red when your time expires and if you would please bring your statement to a conclusion. I want to thank you. Chairman Lick, it's my pleasure to recognize you for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Chairman Rush, Chairman Pallone, Ranking Member McMorris Rogers, Ranking Member Upton, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting my colleagues and me to appear to you before you today to discuss the important work we are doing at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. I'm honored to appear before you for the first time since being designated as chair by President Biden in January. The nation's energy landscape is in the midst of a dramatic transformation, driven by rapid changes in economics, technological innovations, changing consumer preferences, and the exigency of climate change. Utility-scale solar and wind generation is now cost-competitive with traditional sources of electricity. Electric storage is similarly experiencing a significant cost decline. At the same time, residential, commercial, and industrial consumers are increasingly demanding that their energy comes from renewable or zero emissions resources. 
Dozens of the biggest utilities in the country have established their own decarbonization goals, and a growing number of states have enacted measures that require all or most of their electricity to come from zero emissions resources. The Commission's job is not to pick winners and losers, but we do have a role in eliminating barriers to, to a technology's participation in wholesale markets. For instance, over the last several years, FERC issued two landmark orders facilitating energy storage and aggregated distributed energy resources participation in our organized wholesale markets. Today, I will focus my remarks on five priority areas of our work. One, building the transmission grid of the future. Two, modernizing electricity market design. Three, updating FERC's natural gas certificate policy statement. Four, safeguarding the reliability of the electric grid, including protecting against evolving cybersecurity threats. And five, facilitating a more inclusive decision-making process. Renewable generation is often located far from population centers where most electricity is consumed. The rapid shift in the resource mix requires significant investments in new and existing transmission to access those remotely located resources. Two weeks ago, the Commission unanimously approved an advance notice of proposed rulemaking, inviting the public to comment on potential reforms to improve current transmission planning and cost allocation and generator interconnection processes as the nation transitions to a cleaner future. The ultimate aim of this initiative is to meet the transmission needs of the future at the lowest cost to consumers. Through the ANOPER, FERC is taking a critical step toward our first major effort at transmission reform in a decade. And I hope to move forward as expeditiously as possible with this priority work. My organized wholesale electricity markets continue to provide for lower prices, greater efficiencies, and increased innovation. These markets are now some 20 years old and in certain regards may fail, the cha may fail to reflect the changes of the modern electricity sector. One key focus is to address the increasing tension between state public policies and administrative pricing rules. As states were adopting clean energy policies that shift the resource mix towards renewable and zero emissions generation, the Commission expanded its minimum offer price rule in the Eastern Regional Transmission Organization capacity markets in a manner that puts state-supported generation resources at a competitive disadvantage. In my opinion, this, this approach contradicted the Federal Power Act's grant of authority over generation resource decisions for the, for the states, not FERC. In response to strong concerns from the states, the clean energy industry, and consumer groups, the regional grid operators have initiated stakeholder discussions to reform their respective capacity market rules. And I anticipate these discussions will soon lead to proposals to modify the MOPERS. Under the Natural Gas Act, FERC must determine whether a proposed interstate gas pipeline is both needed and in the public interest before issuing a project, the project a certificate of public convenience and necessity. In 2018, then Chairman McIntyre initiated a notice of inquiry seeking input into potential reforms to modernize the Commission's 1999 certificate policy statement. While the Commission received numerous comments at the time, no action was taken. Earlier this year, we issued another notice of increase seeking additional input, including options for determining whether a proposed pipeline project is needed, approaches for evaluating a proposed project's impact on climate change, and what considerations are required when a proposed project would be cited in an environmental justice community. As we have witnessed in Texas this past winter, the prolonged loss of electric service is more than just an inconvenience. It can and did produce tragic consequences. FERC and the North American Electric Reliability Corporation are conducting a joint inquiry into the operations of the bulk electric system during winter storm URI. When that inquiry is complete, I am determined that its results will not merely reflect another report that sits on a shelf. We will work with NERC with the goal of preventing reoccurrence of these events. Whether it is prolonged record cold or heat waves, drought and wildfires, we are again witnessing in the West, climate change poses a distinct threat to grid reliability. The Commission recently initiated a docket to examine the impact of extreme weather on grid reliability. We will continue to focus on actions that utilities and others take to address the growing threat of extreme weather. We need to be equally vigilant when it comes to potential cyber attacks against the grid. At FERC, we use a two-pronged approach to safeguard grid security, employing mandatory standards to set requirements for foundational practices, while we work collaboratively with industry states and other federal agencies to identify and promote best practices. Given the high stakes, we devote constant attention to and continue to improve, uh, uh, explore improvements in cybersecurity. And finally, I wanted to touch on one last thing. FERC's regulatory actions have a significant impact on the lives of millions of people. As a result, it's important that our decision-making process includes robust input from diverse perspectives. That is why I'm pleased the new Office of Public Participation is up and running. I want to commend my colleague, Commissioner Clements, for her leadership and for her work in establishing the office. Toward that goal, I want to highlight FERC's efforts to better incorporate environmental justice and equity concerns into our decision-making. It is unlikely that FERC is hearing from members of historically and marginalized, historically marginalized communities with the same force and frequency as other stakeholders. And thus, it is essential that environmental justice and equity get the attention in our decision-making processes that they deserve. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to responding to your questions.
the gentleman years back. The chair now recognizes uh, the Honorable Neil Chatterjee, Commissioner and Clerk, for five minutes. Chairman Rush and Pallone, Republican leaders with Morris Rogers and Upton, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I appreciate the subcommittee's attention to the important work we do at FERC. Before I turn to the substance of my testimony, I wanna thank my family for their love, support, and many sacrifices over my four-year tenure at the commission. Without my wonderful and talented wife, Becca, I would not be here today. I'd also like to thank my amazing kids, Bo, Anderson, and Lane, and of course, our dog, Oscar, for cheering us all up during the toughest times of the pandemic. I also wanna thank my parents and my sister for their unyielding love and support. My testimony today is divided into three sections. First, I will highlight some of the commission's major accomplishments during my tenure, many of which were bipartisan and necessary to keep pace with the rapid change taking place in the energy sector. Second, I will discuss ongoing efforts initiated during my chairmanship and why it is so important for the commission to complete them. Third, I will identify several areas I think the commission should focus on in the immediate future to ensure American consumers have access to efficient, safe, reliable, and secure energy at a reasonable cost. Serving as chairman of FERC was the honor of my lifetime. I've been blessed to serve my country by working with the most kind and talented collection of people in the federal, federal government. The first major accomplishment I want to mention today is not a policy achievement, but a testament to the commission's stellar staff and is the most gratifying of my tenure. The last 16 months have been challenging for all of us. Our efforts at FERC to be a beacon of stability during such an uncertain time very well may be the highlight of my career. I was proud to see the results of our Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey in which our staff assessed employee satisfaction at an all-time high, all while dealing with lockdowns, juggling work and family responsibilities, and worrying about the well-being of loved ones. I could not be more proud of our ranking as the number one mid-sized agency for performance during the pandemic. But we are not out of the woods yet. As we begin to contemplate reconstitution, it is important that all of us, the chairman, commissioners, senior staff, Get vaccinated. We've worked too hard to keep everyone safe, and I want to really encourage that. My regulatory philosophy is that the commission should never be a barrier to progress. Rather, we should be a catalyst, an enabler of competitive and transparent markets that support needed investments in technologies. The best examples of what I mean here are two landmark bipartisan reforms that we accomplished during my time at the commission. Order 841, which removed barriers to the participation of electric storage resources, and Order 2222, which removed barriers to aggregated distributed energy resources, or DERs, in those markets. I cannot overstate the importance of these foundational rules in paving the way for the grid of the future. When new technologies like these can compete, they thrive, and as a result, consumers win in the form of lower costs, cleaner energy services, and a more resilient and reliable grid. I'm also proud that the commission was able to complete a multi-year effort to modernize its Public Utility Regulatory Policies Act of 1978, or PERPA, regulations when we issued Order 878, uh, 872 last year. Prior to that issuance, the commission had not meaningfully updated its original PERPA regulations that were codified in 1980. Last year's order will ensure the commission's rules and regulations can keep pace with the rapidly changing energy landscape. I'm also pleased with our work to move the ball forward on carbon pricing in electricity markets as an important tool to advance state environmental policies while ensuring wholesale markets remain efficient. Transparent and predictable carbon pricing can enhance competition, facilitate financing, and reduce investor uncertainty. For these reasons, I believe carbon pricing is a superior approach to reducing carbon emissions than heavy-handed, less transparent, and more costly approaches like state subsidies. Turning to infrastructure issues, I am proud of the work we have done to process pipeline and liquefied natural gas facility applications in a timely manner. Connecting abundant American natural gas supplies to domestic and international markets enables low-cost natural gas to displace more carbon-intensive energy sources and lower, lower global emissions. While on the topic of infrastructure, I must note that we have to carefully balance our responsibility to process infrastructure applications with the potential impacts it can create for landowners and communities. That is why, under my leadership, the Commission made organizational and process changes to expedite rehearing requests by affected landowners and issued a rule prohibiting companies from beginning construction until orders on rehearing are completed. 
We also explored a variety of emerging issues during my chairmanship that I hope the commission will, be, will act on in the coming months. These include proceedings exploring hybrid resources, offshore wind resources, adjustable line ratings, and transmission incentives. I was also pleased with a NOPR that we issued last March that proposed to reimagine our transmission incentives policy. In my opinion, our existing incentives policy inappropriately focuses on risks and challenges in contrast with the statutory text that requires the commission to establish incentive-based rate treatments for the purpose of benefiting consumers. Uh, Finally, I want to uh, applaud Chairman Glick and my colleagues for their recent advance NOPER on transmission planning, cost in allocation, and interconnection. Although I do not agree with all of the concepts discussed in the advanced NOPER, some of the proposed changes combined with a strengthened transmission incentives policy could go a long way towards setting the stage for building the regional and inter-regional transmission projects we all hope to see. I'm also interested in how our wholesale energy markets can continue to work as the resource mix shifts to zero marginal cost resources like wind and solar. Finally, although I'm extremely optimistic about the future of energy storage, I'm concerned that our current policies require energy storage resources to make a false choice between participating in wholesale markets and providing transmission service. And uh, I hope to uh, see some clarity in this area. And I want to close real quick. We were each allowed to bring one guest to this hearing today. And I chose to bring FERC Secretary Kimberly Bowes, who is responsible for 4,300 orders during my time at the commission. She's the unsung hero in the commission. And it was an honor to have her here as my guest. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, yes, back. The chair now recognizes Commissioner James Natalie for five minutes. Commissioner Dudley, you're Chairman Rush, Ranking Member Upton, Chairman Pallone, Ranking Member McMorris Rogers, and members of the committee, I want to thank you for the opportunity for us to come today to speak to all of you about the important work we're doing here. Um, it comes no surprise to anyone uh, on this committee. FERC is facing some uh, real challenges in discharging its duties under the Natural Gas Act and Federal Power Act that um, we are attempting to do that in the face of a electric system that's in the middle of a profound transition during a, a time where there is continued need for very challenging infrastructure permitting. And um, also in the context of a bulk power system under constant threat uh, to its reliability. Um, it, FERC is actively engaged in all of these. And as a body, we're deliberating on all of these fundamental matters. Uh, but I want to take no more than a minute or maybe two to highlight the fact that uh, regardless of how we engage in these challenges, we have to keep front and center our legal imperatives, both from the statutes passed by Congress and the instructions that we've gotten from the courts. But first of all, the Federal Power Act requires that rates be just and reasonable. And in the context of our RTOs and ISOs, that means that we have to ensure that the prices created by those market systems are competitive. And the courts have explained to us consistently for years that competitive prices require that we mitigate or have market structures that are designed to mitigate the exercise of market power. Because in the absence of such mitigation, <clears throat> those markets do not produce competitive prices, which means they're not just and reasonable. We have to, as a commission, ensure competition in our jurisdictional markets. Um, similarly, the FPA requires that transmission rates be just and reasonable. And just and reasonable rates, as we embark on this ANOPR, which we voted out at the last open meeting, uh, and it's correct, it was unanimous. I and my colleagues all agree that the subject of transmission planning requires further scrutiny. Um, but as we engage in those deliberations, it's absolutely critical that we keep in mind that all transmission projects the costs are ultimately borne by the ratepayers. And the ratepayers uh, should not, and by judicial decree, cannot be made to pay for uh, any more than a roughly commensurate amount based on the benefits they receive. That is to say, the costs to the ratepayer must be roughly commensurate to the benefits that they receive. As we move forward, we have to ensure that. Um, we do not enact policies that would encourage gold plating or unnecessary transmission build out and that we keep cost causation principles. Um, there is also the obligation to have a reliable electric system. And typically people think of that as being in the context of our oversight and approval of FERC, uh, excuse me, NERC, uh, mandatory reliability standards. 
which is to say, if the price signals produced by our, our um, by our uh, by our jurisdictional markets do not properly create the correct incentives for the entry and retention of the correct quantity of generation with the right attributes, we are going to have uh, reliability crises like we saw last summer in California. Um, and I know I and my colleagues are all well aware of, of uh, the interplay between the resource adequacy and market prices. And lastly, on the subject of uh, natural gas infrastructure, um, we, do, we, we oversee the implementation of the Natural Gas Act, the purpose of which is to ensure the orderly development of plentiful supplies of natural gas at reasonable prices. Uh, the commission is obligated to issue certificates of public convenience and necessity to pipeline applicants whose projects are needed in the public interest. And as we have recently and, and sadly witnessed, uh, supply constraints in natural gas have very, very consequential effects, um, not just for gas consumers, but for uh, electric consumers too. When the gas supply fails, it often happens that the electric supply fails. Um, at the moment, the natural gas industry is facing uh, tremendous regulatory uncertainty and uh, investment in this critical infrastructure has chilled as a result of it. And I believe it is imperative to discharge the Natural Gas Act that FERC establish clear policies by which we will review and adjudicate these pipeline applications so that we can attract the investment that's needed for this infrastructure. Um, those were just a few points that I wanted to highlight the legal obligations we have that we have to consider uh, in all of our deliberations. And I very much look forward to the uh, questions from the committee. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman has concluded his opening statement. You will make his time. The chair now recognizes the Honorable Allison Clements, uh, who is a commissioner at FERC. Commissioner Clements, you are recognized for five minutes. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman Rush, Chairman Pallone, Leader Rogers, Ranking Member Upton, and members of the subcommittee. It's an honor to be here to testify with my colleagues this morning. The Commission's core responsibility under the Federal Power Act is to ensure affordable, reliable electric service for the American public. For decades, the Commission has met this objective by adapting its regulations to reflect changing circumstances, which have included technological advancements, shifting economic and market dynamics, and evolving federal, state, and local energy policies. While the Commission's adaptation to change is familiar, the current magnitude of the challenges driving the need for change is unprecedented. I believe two major challenges must guide the planning of our nation's electric grid. First, on a distressingly regular basis, extreme weather is, is challenging our electric system in extraordinary ways. You all are very familiar with the record heat, drought, and wildfire conditions we're experiencing and blanketing the West as well as the unprecedented extreme cold weather most recently experienced in Texas and the central U.S. in February. Second, the transmission system is not equipped to facilitate the rapidly changing resource mix. Declining costs of wind, solar, and hybrid generation are making these technologies increasingly competitive and the preferred choice for states, communities, and corporations. Fortunately, Recent experience has illuminated solutions capable of addressing these challenges, consistent with the Commission's statutory obligations. Initially, modernizing the U.S. energy system requires a cost-effective build-out of high-voltage transmission. Initial analyses of the February cold weather event and previous polar vortex conditions have consistently demonstrated the reliability and resilience potential of high-voltage transmission investment. In addition, all credible studies considering cost-effective decarbonization pathways include significant high-voltage transmission as a central component. Further, establishment of well-designed regional transmission organizations is critical to cost-effectively serving customers given these conditions we face. While existing RTOs are by no means perfect, geographically large grid areas operated by independent entities can improve resilience and contribute to reliability while cost-effectively integrating increasing amounts of low-cost wind, solar, and hybrid generation. The need for more effective regional integration is especially stark in the West, 
Earlier this year, a Utah-led study demonstrated that an RTO could bring up to $2 billion in annual savings to the region by 2030. So what is the Commission's role in facilitating these solutions? First, the Commission should improve regional and in-regional transmission planning processes. As you heard from my colleagues, the Commission's recently issued advance notice of proposed rulemaking examines how holistic, forward-looking planning may save customers money as well as improve system reliability and resilience. Second, consistent with the Federal Power Act's framework of cooperative federalism, the Commission should continue its work to enhance state-federal coordination. The Joint Federal-State Transmission Task Force the Commission recently approved is a great start towards improving engagement and this cooperation. This cooperation is also essential in furthering Western market integration. To be successful, any Western RTO must be designed by Western states for Western states. The Commission must respect these states' perspectives and stand ready to provide guidance and expertise in the process. Third, the Commission should continue its work to ensure public access by growing the Office of Public Participation. Reform cannot exceed unless the public has access to and is heard in the Commission's decision-making processes. We've recently taken this important step of establishing the Office of Public Participation, the mission of which is to help ensure meaningful access to Commission proceedings for those whose communities, property, and pocketbooks are implicated by the outcomes of our decisions. It has been a great honor to begin service to the American public. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to answering your questions. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Yus Mack, uh, and uh, now I want to recognize the uh, last commissioner, uh, Commissioner Mark C. Christie, for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. Commissioner, you're recognized. Well, thank you, uh, <clears throat> Committee Chairman Pallone and Subcommittee Chairman Rush. Ranking Member McMorris Rogers and Ranking Member Upton. It's an, it really is an honor for me to be here. This is my first appearance as a FERC regulator, and uh, so I can't thank you enough for this opportunity. Um, I want to talk about my two priorities as a FERC regulator and what I hope will be FERC's priorities. And I want to do so from the standpoint of someone who, before I got to FERC, I spent 17 years as a state utility regulator, and so I have a perspective that comes from that, that experience. Uh, my two top priorities, and I would hope what would be FERC's top two priorities are very similar to the priorities that state regulators have. Number one, reliability. Keep the lights on. Number two, protect consumers from excessive costs. And this is particularly important as we go through what everyone acknowledges is the changing generation mix and efforts to reduce carbon emissions. Let me elaborate a minute on, on reliability and, and the cost issue. On reliability, consumers in America expect their lights to be on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Now, even the best run utilities don't meet that standard because that's perfection. Everybody's gonna have a, a, a transformer blow or a tree fall on a line, but if those uh, can, outages can be restored in a matter of minutes or hours, that's a, that's a very good system, and that's what we ought to be aiming for. When the lights go out and the power goes out for days at a time, as we saw in Texas in February in California last summer, uh, that is not only a, a threat to convenience, that is also a threat to public health and safety. So reliability needs to be uh, uh, our job one at FERC, and we do it three ways. We, of course, regulate NERC, uh, which sets the mandatory standards. We regulate transmission planning, uh, and we also regulate RTOs, and that's particularly important with regard to their capacity markets, which is where they get their, their resource adequacy. On the issue of cost, uh, the, the general division between FERC and state regulators is that FERC regulates wholesale rates and state regulators uh, regulate retail rates. And of course, retail rates is what shows up in people's bills. That's what drives consumers' monthly bills. But one thing I learned, and sometimes the hard way, is what, while FERC does wholesale rates, um, it's what FERC does often dramatically affects retail rates. And again, that's going to affect the monthly bills that consumers pay. So we need to be extremely sensitive, I think, at all times to what are going to be the effects of our actions at FERC on retail rates because that's going to show up in customers' monthly bills. And with regard to transmission, last week, as has been mentioned, we, we started the process. Uh, we call it an ANOPER. We have a lot of acronyms in this business. 
And the, uh, the ANOPA is essentially a process to, to look at the transmission system holistically and see what improvements need to be made uh, and, and to promote both reliability um, as well as, uh, but we have to protect consumer costs at, at the same time. And we need to build the transmission that's needed, uh, set on many, many transmission cases, approving many cases, many uh, transmission projects. If they're needed, they need to be built. But I hope what we don't do is end up uh, promoting transmission that uh, is not necessarily uh, needed or does not have uh, cost commensurate uh, to the consumer for the benefits the consumer is going to receive. If we're not careful, we could end up with enabling uh, literally trillions of dollars of transmission uh, that is not necessarily going to have benefits uh, commensurate to the consumer. So if it's needed, it needs to be built. There's a lot of improvements that need to be made in the transmission planning process, and so it's good we're embarking on that process. But we need to also be very, very sensitive to the cost of consumers throughout. And with that, I thank you very much, and I look forward to any questions you may have. And again, it's an honor to be here for the first time as a FERC commissioner, so I thank you for that. I want to thank you, uh, gentlemen, you and Mac. Uh, and we have now concluded the opening statements. Uh, we will now, uh, at the same time, move to member questions. Each member will have five minutes to ask questions of our, of our witnesses, and I will begin uh, by recognizing myself for five minutes. Uh, Chairman Gillick, President Biden is working to harness uh, the full force of the federal government toward tackling climate change. This committee has worked diligently to invest federal policies to fight climate change in a similar manner. Under your leadership, how will FERC play a more active role in clean energy transition as well as climate change mitigation and adaption? Uh, and how can Congress support FERC in accomplishing uh, this vital and important work? Thank you very much for the question, Chairman Rush. So FERC is an independent agency, so we don't, we don't necessarily take our directions from the White House, but I think we, we react to what's going on in the market. As I mentioned earlier in my opening testimony, there's a lot of change going on right now. There's, there's, there's definitely, because of state policies, because of uh, consumer preferences, because of utility decisions, there's definitely a movement towards um, uh, cleaner energy, zero emissions energy. And our role is several fold, one of which is that under the Federal Power Act, we're supposed to prevent um, undue discrimination and preference. And so one of our roles, I think, is to, is to eliminate barriers to newer technologies. So a lot of the rules, the market rules were, that were created around the country were created in large part uh, many years ago when some of these uh, newer technologies were not necessarily cost effective. And so what we did, and under Chairman Chatterjee's leadership with regard to energy storage, but also distributed energy resources is a good example of that, where we get rid of barriers. And we're still looking at other barriers right now. There might be barriers to hybrid projects, for instance, both solar and, uh, and storage, for instance, some of these projects that are coming online today. Um, so that's one. Secondly, with regard, we have significant authority over the uh, transmission grid. And uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, there's a significant amount of demand for newer transmission to access remotely located renewable resources, for instance, but also to improve the reliability of the grid. So our goal isn't necessarily just to promote transmission uh, because uh, that's going to help reduce emissions. Our goal is to promote trans the, the right type of transmission, the more, more, most cost-effective transmission under our authorities under the Federal Power Act. We know there's going to be demand for transmission anyway. There's significant demand for it. It's our job to make sure that it's built cost-effectively, efficiently, addresses reliability concerns, addresses uh, consumer cost concerns. And so that's, that's our particular role as it relates to the current transition mm -hmm. to the clean energy future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Clements, do you uh, agree? To, is there something you would like to add to this? Thank you, Chairman Rush, for the important question. I think I could sum, uh, sum up Chairman Glick's um, good, good answer in a bow to say the Commission's job is to protect customers and ensure reliability as this, these changes happen, and that's going to be a lot of work. Um, if you just look at the interconnection queues around the country, there are 750 gigawatts of projects in the interconnection queue, 700 of those gigawatts are wind, solar, or hybrid generation projects. 
If you don't look even beyond the, the interconnection queue, that's where the market is driving us. That's where customer preferences and policies are driving us, and it's our job Thank to protect customers you. by looking forward. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Commissioner Blumens, a uh, June 24, 21 report states that the Office of Public Participation will ensure that, and I quote, tribal members, environmental justice communities, and other historically marginalized communities are fully and fairly considered in the commission proceeding. Uh, I want to just ask you and also Chairman Glink, how has the Office of Public Participation supported clerks consideration of historically marginalized communities to date, and how will it uh, continue to uh, support um, in, in the, these, on these issues in the future. Thank you, Chairman Rush. The Office of Public Participation provides an access point. It provides an entree to a technical, complex agency for people who are implicated by our decisions. It's a starting point, and it certainly will place an emphasis on, disadva emphasis on disadvantaged communities, including designated environmental justice communities. Well, and that concludes the chairman's time, and the chair will now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Upton, for five minutes for the purpose of seeing the witnesses. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I know that all of us are troubled by the recent cyber attacks, uh, linked, particularly those that are linked to Russia and China, on our critical infrastructure and the, the Ransomware attacks on the Colonial Pipeline in May was uh, not a wake-up call. We've been sounding the alarm for years uh, on this issue. So the public's been learning about that China has been hacking our pipelines for over a decade, uh, gaining access to the controls of several U.S. natural gas pipeline companies. Chairman Glick and others, what authorities does FERC have to ensure that these gas pipelines, especially those connected to power plants, are secure? And what more can we do to provide the tools in the toolbox to stop this? Well, Mr. Upton, first I want to commend you. I know that you've been a leader on this issue for a number of years now. It's a very important issue. Uh, Commissioner Chatterjee and I actually wrote an op-ed in the uh, Houston Chronicle several years ago about this very point. We have a significant authority over the reliability of the bulk power system, along with NERC to establish minimum reliability standards, for instance. But um, uh, the TSA, not FERC, has authority over the entire pipeline system in the United States. And there's been some concerns. Uh, TSA, for a number of years, had relied on voluntary guidance as opposed to the mandatory standard approach that we use at FERC. And I don't think that's sufficient given the threat that you just out outlined with regard to foreign adversaries in our pipeline system. Uh, to, to TSA's credit, they did the other day, um, uh, or at least announced that they were going to impose mandatory standards on some pipelines, and we'll have to I haven't had a chance to actually see the standards yet. We're going to have to take a look at that. Others? Former chairman? Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, um, uh, Congressman Upton. I think, you know, for me, um, this is a new reality that all of us have to deal with in the energy space. Um, the example I use is that if a missile had taken out the Colonial Pipeline, we would have very clearly recognized that as an act of terrorism or war and known how to respond accordingly. Our mindsets are not quite there yet for something like a cyber attack taking out critical energy infrastructure, but the reality is the economic and national security impact is the same as if it were a missile attack. And so I think it's incumbent upon all of us to remain vigilant, identify regulatory gaps, uh, and, and work to stay ahead of this. Um, standards are one way to go about it, but it's not the only way to go about it. There are other simpler things that we ought to do. Um, for instance, I had a CEO of a uh, natural gas pipeline company tell me he was briefed by Odie and I at a high level that his system was vulnerable, but no one in his company even had a high enough security clearance to gain access to the classified briefing necessary to know where to make an investment in their system. These kinds of things are easily remediable, and, and we need to find ways to ensure that uh, the private sector, where these executives now find themselves on the front lines of 21st century warfare, I don't think that's a hyperbolic statement. That's the reality of protecting critical infrastructure today, and we need to work together. And do you, just a quick follow-up before we go to uh, Commissioner Danley. So do you think that that is uh, an inherent problem with many in the, in the industry, that they don't have enough people at the classified level to be able to figure this thing out? 
There's no question that access to clearances has been an issue. It's been something that's been frustrating uh, to me throughout my tenure at the commission. Uh, we have taken some steps in this area. FERC has never previously had a seat at the Intelligence Committee table. We now have intelligence capabilities. We're building a SCIF uh, at the agency to house classified information, and we're now able to do one-day read-ins so people, uh, necessary stakeholders, can get access to this critical information. Okay, Commissioner Danley. Yes, it's been a problem for a long time. And uh, over the last few years, um, our Office of Energy Infrastructure Security has done a tremendous job in employing the uh, commission's convening authority to have discussions with as many people as possible, conduct architecture. Related to our legal authorities, but I think it's been an ex uh, beneficial program that, that OEIS has been conducting. We also have interactions with uh, CISA and, and uh, the, the EISAC. These are, are again, convening uh, authority uh, undertakings in which the industry talks about the challenges that are being uh, faced by everybody in common. Um, we don't have particularly profound legal powers to do things in this realm. And as, a, as an economic regulator and a multi-member body, I'm not sure that something that's as fast paced and moving as cybersecurity really is, is perfectly well suited to us as an agency, but certainly uh, it's a subject that needs to be dealt with by, by the government generally. If I know my time has expired, so um, if we could get comments maybe in writing from the remaining two, that, that'd be uh, terrific. And since my time has expired, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the Mr. Paul, the chairman of the full committee, for five minutes for questioning the witnesses. Thank you, Chairman Rush. My question is kind of a follow-up to uh, what uh, Mr. Upton said. Um, I know that um, Chairman Glick, you and Commissioner Clements uh, issued a statement after the Colonial Pipeline attack calling for mandatory cybersecurity standards for pipelines. Can you, let me ask you, Chairman Glick, can you elaborate uh, on why you think mandatory cybersecurity standards for pipelines are necessary and whether you believe the American public would also benefit from other types of pipeline reliability standards similar to those that govern the electric industry? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I, I, I do agree that, that I think we need to have mandatory reliability standards, cybersecurity and non-cybersecurity related on the on the, with regard to the natural gas pipeline system. Um, you know, again, your mandatory st standards are necessarily, they're a minimum floor. They're not necessarily uh, the end-all and be-all. We need to do additional work beyond that. But in fact, I think it's worked out very well in the electric sector in the sense that we have uh, utilities, uh, all other uh, participants in the bulk power system are at least mi meeting minimum standards. And we saw a good example was Texas this past winter. Because they didn't have any mandatory standards, they just had guidance as to whether they should winterize or not. We saw what happened when, util when utilities and other generators only have you know, guidance they don't necessarily have to follow. And so I think uh, it, it's, it's important from a cybersecurity perspective, but important from a reliability perspective. Because we, again, we have authority over the bulk power system, but if a pipeline goes out or two pipelines go out, it can have significant adverse impacts on the bulk electric system. And I think there's just a, a, a mismatch between the mandatory standards that the electric industry follows and the, and the voluntary guidance that the, the pipeline industry currently follows. Well, thank you. And I wanted to ask you, uh, uh, something relative to my state. About a month ago, the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities approved the nation's largest combined offshore wind award to construct a total of 2,658 megawatts of wind capacity. And I think this is going to create a lot of jobs and economic, ben economic benefits to New Jersey. But I recognize there are challenges to constructing the transmission infrastructure necessary to accommodate a large increase in offshore wind. Uh, and that FERC explored these issues during a technical conference last year. So can I ask you again, Chairman Click, can you help us understand what these transmission-related challenges are and what Congress can do to help ensure that this necessary infrastructure gets built in an efficient and cost-effective manner to achieve our clean energy goals? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, you know, as I understand it, there's about 30,000 megawatts of planned um, offshore wind facilities that are currently in the, in the process through the government bidding system already. And so we're, we did have a technical conference on this issue. We also actually addressed this issue. We tried to address this issue in our advance notice of proposed rulemaking 
that we proposed a couple of weeks ago asking a number of questions in this area. But in particular, I think the issue has to do with planning. We currently plan for transmission, trying to, trying to figure out what's already a long, long line, what, what, trans, what generation plan is about to be built, but we don't do any long-term planning. Again, we know there's going to be 30,000 megawatts at least of offshore wind off the eastern United States, but we don't plan the grid for that. So that, that would be the number one area I think we need to focus on is, is having a better, improved planning system to make sure we know what's going to be out. We know that the offshore wind's going to get built. How do we build the transmission grid to access that energy and bring it onshore? Yeah, I mean, it's really important and I, you know, a challenge because I know the state, uh, you know, has very ambitious plans over the next 10 years and, I, and I'm very happy to hear that they are. Um, one more question. Um, this deals with the Natural Gas Act. Um, the current regulatory regime fails to adequately account for climate change. And, um, you know, we drafted the Clean Future Act in the committee, which I mentioned. But FERC has the authority to address these climate issues without further legislative action as part of its reconsideration of the 1999 cert Certificate Policy Statement. Can you commit to taking a hard look at how the Commission can better protect landowners and state interests in this certification process and also whether the commission should revise its methodology for determining the need for a proposed project and whether it's in the public interest. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. So with regard to, first with regard to greenhouse gas emissions associated with the pipeline, not only do we have the authority, actually the courts have told us, the DC Circuit has told us on several occasions that we actually have to examine the impact of a proposed project on greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. We haven't done that historically. Uh, actually, we, we did. The commission just recently, a couple months ago, actually moved in that direction. And, and thanks to Commissioner Clements and Commissioner Chatterjee, we ended up voting out an order that, that actually does that. And I think we'll be exploring those issues in our notice of inquiry, as you mentioned. But with regard, there's a whole variety of other issues that have arisen over the last 20 years since, uh, that the, since the policy statement was first issued, actually 1999. And I, we asked a series of questions in the notice of inquiry. We intend to act on it hopefully relatively soon. But in very important issues, such as you mentioned, landowner protection. Landowners uh, right now don't have enough uh, insight into the process that we currently use. And even more importantly, you mentioned on the issue of need. Uh, the DC Circuit just told us a couple of weeks ago that you can't just rely on precedent agreements, contracts between affiliates, uh, to, to determine whether a project is needed or not, which is required under the Natural Gas Act. So one of the areas that we're looking into in the notice of inquiry is how do we, how do we assess need beyond just precedent agreements between affiliated companies? And uh, that's something I'm, I'm very much committed to. The courts told us we need to address it, and I'm hoping that we can, again, address this notice of inquiry proceeding and get it uh, moving towards the new policy statement relatively soon. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The chair yields back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Burgess for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Chairman Rush. Commissioner Glick, let me... Uh, let me stay with you for a minute and, and along the lines of what um, Chairman Pallone was just asking, how, how, do, how, is, how are you increasing visibility for the landowner, whether it be for a transmission line or for a pipeline? How, what do you have underway to, so that people know what's over the horizon? Well, in one area, what, through our office, new Office of Public Participation, what we will be doing, we just established the office, is reaching out to landowners, essentially providing them with an opportunity to understand how to intervene in our proceedings, how to participate. Obviously, they have very important um, uh, interests that are affected by our proceedings, especially when there's eminent domain involved. And so uh, one of the things we'll do, we'll be reaching out to them to encourage them and, and help them figure out a way to intervene in our proceedings. Again, we're not going to take their side one way or another, but we're going to help them participate. But secondly, we recently issued an order in which we said, OK, when we issue a certificate of public convenience necessity under the law, the pipeline developer automatically gets the right of eminent domain after that. But that's even before the, the landowner or anybody else affected by the pipeline gets to litigate the issue. So now we said what we're going to do is we're going to hold on to the certificate statement and not issue it, the certificate and not issue it until the landowner or anybody else has the right to pursue their rehearing responsibilities under the Natural Gas Act at FERC, and then they can go to court and, and have their day in court uh, before someone takes, it, takes their land by eminent domain and starts building on it. So uh, I'm from Texas. We had the situation there where the, uh, the wind farms out in West Texas produce the energy, and the people live 250 miles east of there uh, in my district in, in Dallas, and they're the ones that need the energy. So <laughs> my district sits between the wind farms and the people who need the energy. So 
we've seen a lot of building. Now, most of these, my understanding, has been at the state, under state jurisdiction, under what is, I think, is called the Competitive Renewable Energy Zone uh, um, process. But I, I do know it has been particularly painful for a number of constituents when faced with those types of decisions. And it's always, uh, you know, it's always tough. And, and people feel like they haven't had an opportunity to be, to be heard. Uh, so what I'm hearing you saying today is you're going to try to make an effort to improve on the visibility of that process? Both the visibility and also the, the ability to, to have your day in court, essentially, before uh, your land is taken under eminent domain. Well, let me ask you this. Um, I mean, you have to work with um, a number of, of other agencies when you when you cite a facility or, or a project. Um, do you have any success in holding those other agencies to a schedule? Uh, or are you at the mercy as any other litigant would be? So it, it depends on, on the, the process. So for instance, we cite natural gas so interstate natural gas pipelines. We also cite hydroelectric license. We, through, through our licensing process, cite hydroelectric facilities. On interstate natural gas pipelines, uh, we, we, we do set schedules. We are the lead ag agency in that particular process. Other agencies have certainly input, but I think they're, the, the, our process works, moves relatively quickly because we do establish deadlines, and for the most part, util, uh, other agencies follow that. On the licensing process, the hydro licensing process is a different story. Other agencies have mandatory conditioning authority. Uh, these processes take forever, and uh, uh, sometimes our licensing process takes 10 years and even longer. And we don't have really the ability to tell the Interior Department or, or the Commerce Department, for instance, that you have to get your, your, your conditions in by such and such date, which is lengthened that particular process. So is, uh, you have, have, you, have you any ideas on how the permitting process might be improved? Well, I know that there are there are proposals out there, for instance, to help uh, facilitate uh, other agency uh, resource agency participation in our hydro process. For instance, um, currently there's a question about whether our proceedings are, would, would involve an ex parte requirement or a limitation on other agencies participating in our proceeding. I know there have been proposals that have been floated in the past, including uh, in this particular Congress, that would allow other agencies to participate in our proceedings without worrying about ex parte restrictions, and I think that would help move along the process more efficiently. So is there uh, anything you look to the legislative branch to produce for you that could improve the speed and transparency I of permitting some of these energy projects? So I think, I think on, the, on the hydroelectric side, I do think if Congress did provide the authority or, or authorized other agencies to participate in our proceeding without worrying about ex parte communications, that would be helpful. We can't do that without congressional action. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, yield back nine seconds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank the gentleman for you in the man, nine seconds. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Peters, for five, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to all the commissioners for your service and for being here today. Uh, Mr. Chatterjee, I did want to say I appreciate the comment about the superiority of carbon pricing to uh, state governments picking subsidies. I think the planet will be uh, way better off the sooner we realize that, and I appreciate that. But uh, So thanks for singing my song. I wanted to talk about something else today, though. So I want to talk about um, interstate transmission, uh, which is integral to, so to solving several interrelation inter interrelated challenges I think we've heard about today, including resiliency of our energy systems, um, maintaining our national security, reducing costs for consumers. Um, and just in the last couple months, we've seen power crises that have re revealed the vulnerabilities in our existing systems in Texas and in California. And while each event is unique, the extreme weather that exacerbated both is only going to get more common uh, due to climate change. And we know this too well in the American West with record heat waves and drought already stressing our communities. I wanted to point out that a report from the American Council on Renewable Energy found that each additional gigawatt of transmission capacity connecting the Texas power grid with neighboring states could have saved nearly $1 billion and kept the heat on for approximately 200,000 Texas homes during the winter storm URI in February of last year. So uh, I think it's very clear we have to act quickly and effectively to, to uh, build out uh, interstate transmission uh, for purposes of uh, dealing with climate, uh, building a clean energy economy, increasing our resiliency, and lowering consumer costs. Um, I introduced a bill to clarify FERC's backstop siting authority for more interstate transmission projects. 
uh, the Power On Act um, that would accelerate the build out of clean energy, increase our reliability, lower the cost of electricity. It's been endorsed by key groups, including Americans for a Clean Energy Grid, the American Clean Power Association, and the American Council on Renewable Energy. Chairman Glick, you may or may not want to comment on that particular approach, but I did want you to tell me what you think are the major obstacles to the build out of interstate high voltage transmission. Thank you very much, Mr. Peters. Um, I think there are really three major impediments to the development of additional transmission to the grid. One of them is the siting situation, as you mentioned. In some cases, uh, some states have been uh, more proactive than others in, in improving siting, and when you're trans, uh, building a transmission line that's crossing two or more states, sometimes that's difficult to coordinate among the various states. Secondly, is pl and, and then, as you noted, that role is primarily the role of the, of the states and not the federal government. The other two impediments, though, are things, things we have authority over today, one of which is planning. As I mentioned earlier, I think there's an issue with, our, with regard to our transmission planning process. We're not looking to the future. What We know the generation that's going to get built. Commissioner Clements mentioned 93% of all the generation in the interconnection queue currently are, are wind and solar. And so we know it's going to get built. We know essentially where it is. But we're not plan when we're planning for transmission, we're looking at what's the next, next, tra next generation project that's going to be built as opposed to what as a whole is going to get built. And that, that's, a, that's been a big impediment. And we're addressing that in our, in our ANOPA process. And third is cost allocation. Uh, everyone wants transmission to be built. No one wants to pay for it. That's, 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 I think that's, everyone's clear about that. But we, our job is to, is to uh, allocate cost in a matter that are, uh, uh, transmission uh, costs are roughly commensurate with benefits. And the concern there is that in the past, at least, when, when we looked at some of our cost allocation approaches, we've been looking at, are you getting power on the line? If you are, you're a beneficiary. If you're not getting power on the line, you're not. But the fact is, these transmission uh, assets provide significant benefits elsewhere. So for instance, it reduces congestion. Even if you're not getting power from that line, it's bringing in cheaper power elsewhere. Or uh, increases reliability, enhances resilience. And I just want to quickly mention, you mentioned Texas. Yeah, let, me, Great. let me follow up, though, Sorry. because I, I only have a, a short time left. And I, you know, Commissioner Clements mentioned the importance of good planning process, which is great. But if we don't build stuff, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to the planet. It doesn't matter to the consumers. It doesn't matter to resiliency. You said that the, the first, that first point was outside of your um, particular jurisdiction. What does Congress need to do to, to get you in a place or get us in a place where we see these lines built? So it's primarily out of our jurisdiction. We currently have backstop siting authority today. If a transmission line is planned in part of a, a, a grid corridor that the DOE designates. But the courts have ruled that backstop siting authority only applies in a case where a state doesn't act at all. If a state says no, that backstop authority doesn't provide. I know that could be corrected by statute, can it not? Excuse me? That could be corrected by Absol statute. Absolutely. I think your, I think your uh, bill does that, does that very point, okay. does that very thing. I, w I just want to say um, I, I appreciate, uh, appreciate your work, and um, I, I intend to see that we can make sure that we provide the authority to you so that when states and tribes and everybody can't get off the dime, you know, there's a national interest in getting these projects built. And I think um, that's, that's on us, and you've made that clear today, and I look forward to, to addressing that problem with you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentlemen, you yield back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle, for five minutes. What? What? Okay. Sorry. Is it, is it over on the Republican side? Sure now the gentleman from Ohio. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I appreciate that. And uh, also, thank you very much for uh, today's hearing and for all the commissioners for either being with us in person or virtually today. Really appreciate that. Uh, Chairman Glick, uh, my, my first question is to you and uh, kind of, again, a background of my district. Uh, well over 60,000 manufacturing jobs. We make everything there from glass to steel to uh, a central foundry uh, for, uh, for, with General Motors. Uh, we make tires, uh, you know, so we make furniture. We have the largest glass or food uh, processing plant in the world is located in my district. And one of the issues I've been concerned about is the need to prepare the electric grid to withstand emergencies that threaten its normal operations, particularly the threat of cyber attacks. I know that some of the questions a little bit earlier have been dealing with pipelines, and we're very concerned with pipelines. But on the electric side, you know, uh, the House recently passed legislation that I led with my good friend uh, from uh, California, Ms. McNerney, to address cyber attacks on the grid infrastructure, and I believe we need to continue to look for ways to improve the grid's resilience. Will you provide your thoughts on grid resilience, how we can define it, and what we can do to protect the electric grid against, you know, current and future cyber attacks? 
So with regard to the definitions of grid resilience, uh, you know, I, I can give you my definition. The commission had this issue pending before us for a couple of years, and we, can, we never actually came up with an actual definition. But it's, it's essentially, uh, in, my, in my opinion, essentially being prepared for events that aren't necessarily going to happen very frequently, but, uh, but could have horrific effects. And I think, that's, uh, I think that's what we all need to be prepared for from a grid perspective. Um, with regard to cybersecurity, there's no doubt that that, that is the, the biggest threat facing the electric grid today is cybersecurity. And um, the, the, we, you open up the paper every day, there's all sorts of uh, stories about various, whether it be ransomware or attacks from nation states or so on. And um, we, from our perspective, we attack that particular issue twofold. One, uh, through with the NERC process, we actually established mandatory minimum standards uh, through our what they call the SIP standard approach that I think has, has been very helpful in getting utilities to make the investments they need to make on cybersecurity. But secondly, we work with other government agencies, we work with industries, we work with um, uh, 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 other, other uh, think tanks and so on. And we essentially help, help develop a, a dialogue between industry, between government, between NERC, for instance, and, and, and try to encourage them to make additional investments to be also be aware of the threats that are, that are occurring. Obviously, we know the threats evolve almost every day. And so we try to stay on it through, those, through those, that ongoing dialogue. Well, thank you. Uh, Commissioner uh, Christie, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I incorporate by reference uh, what Chairman Glick said and, and former Chairman Chatterjee on, on cybersecurity. I know FERC has, has got a division which has uh, got tremendous expertise uh, on the question of cybersecurity. And I know they worked with TSA and TSA's uh, regulations that they issued uh, last week. I said before that while mandatory standards are fine, uh, uh, the, the, the attack on the colonial pipeline, it if it was a state actor, it was an act of war, and if it was a non-state actor, it was an act of terrorism. And so the response needs to be commensurate to that, to that threat. And mandatory standards are, are, are fine. Again, as I think uh, was said earlier, FERC is an economic regulator, uh, and our authority is limited, and our expertise, which is, which is outstanding in the cybersecurity area, is still limited. So I think that when you look at, the, at what happened in Colonial Pipeline, the, the seriousness of that really demands a response much higher than, than an economic regulator such as FERC. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Chatterjee, uh, Chatterjee, when you were the uh, chairman, you pri prioritized grid resilience and reliability, and you opened a docket at FERC to review proposals to strengthen the grid. In your view, why is it important for FERC to examine that grid resilience, and why did you oppose the move to close the docket? Yeah, look, it's a real issue, and um, it's one that is, uh, I think, going to be a challenge that needs to be addressed uh, in a clear-eyed way. Um, I bear some culpability uh, for why the resilience docket moved the way it did. Uh, when I first came to the commission, um, I've publicly admitted I struggled at first to make the transition from partisan legislative aid to independent regulator. I had just come from spending a decade of my career working for Leader McConnell on behalf of coal communities in Kentucky, and the manner in which I handled Secretary Perry's uh, DOE, NOPER, on grid resilience, I didn't handle it well, and it added this element of politics to what is a real issue. And so I'm hopeful now, while I was frustrated that the commission closed the original resilience docket, I was encouraged that a new docket was open, called something different, but essentially looking at the same issues. And perhaps after I depart the commission um, and this element of politics that I unfortunately injected into it is removed, the commission and my colleagues can, can work together with the staff to really address what is a serious issue. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My time has expired, and I yield back. Gentlemen, you are back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from New York, chairman of the Environmental Subcommittee, Mr. Tonko, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Rush, and thank you, Chairman Glick and commissioners for your testimony. I agree this is a critical moment for FERC because our energy system is rapidly changing, and we need our federal regulators to be nimble enough to keep up with these developments while ensuring we maintain reliable and affordable energy services. So Chairman Glick, I'm very glad to see the Commission is examining transmission policy uh, head on. I know that will not be an easy task, but it is essential to the success uh, of a rapid and cost-effective energy transition. Is your sense that there are low-cost, zero-emission resources that could be competing in electricity markets, but for a lack of adequate transmission infrastructure? 
I think there's no doubt that's the case. There, there are many projects that have been canceled, clean energy projects have been canceled because they're for some distance from the grid and uh, not insufficient amounts of transmission were available to transport that to load centers. And the planning process has been a significant barrier for inter-regional transmission. How does the advance notice of proposed rulemaking consider the need for improved inter-regional planning? Well, we definitely need an improved inter-regional transmission planning process, and um, uh, the ANOPER asked a number of questions about it, but in particular, there's essentially a triple hurdle right now. If you build a, a, a transmission line between two regions, it has to be approved by one region, then it has to be approved by another region, then it has to be approved by the regions jointly, and that's just that's too much, too bureaucratic, takes too much time, it's too costly, and so we're fr fr trying to figure out a way to streamline the process because it's very important. If you don't build inter-regional transmission, and, and it was mentioned earlier about Texas, if they were able to access uh, power from other parts of the, other parts of the, um, the country, they would have been able to, um, I'm not sure they would have been able to avoid all blackouts, but certainly the situation would have been less dire. And why has cost allocation been such a barrier to uh, transmission development? Well, um, because these projects, sometimes the projects can be very expensive, and if you, if you um, subject uh, a, a particular a small set of customers, to having to pay for the cost of a particular transmission project, that sometimes it fa fails under its own weight. I'll give you an example with regard to, we talked about the interconnection queue. And currently, with regard to, with regard to projects, when, when, you, when you have a, pro a generation project in the interconnection queue, you have to pay for the network upgrades. Essentially, um, uh, it's called participant funding. They require the generators to pay the full cost of building out the transmission grid to be able to access that new generation facility. The problem is there's a lot of other folks that benefit from that particular new transmission investment as well. We don't take that into account, and that actually delays the ability of um, uh, the, the new generation. New, new, sometimes it's too costly for new generation to be built if they have to pay the full amount. And in the past, have some projects benefits been considered on a very narrow basis, even if those projects support achieving a state's policy requirements or reducing air pollution? Well, we, and we, we, we require those types of projects in, in our regional planning processes, the, the cost, there's a cost allocation methodology that each particular region comes up with on their own. But in the past, it's, again, it's, it's, it's actually stunted the development of transmission because sometimes it's difficult for a region to agree on a particular transmission cost allocation approach when you take such a narrow view of the way we've, we've allocated costs in the past. And what is the advance notice of proposed rulemaking considering for uh, cost allocation? Uh, again, we, we asked a number of questions with regard to, to, to cost allocation, but we asked in particular, and we're hoping to get a number of comments for, about this, we asked in particular, are there better ways to assess benefits? Again, we have, as Chairman, as Commissioner Danley mentioned, we have to allocate costs roughly commensurate with benefits, as the courts have told us, but we, we, we asked for in, input as to what those benefits might be beyond just, again, receiving power on a particular line. And while transmission is critical, we would be remiss if we did not acknowledge there are also barriers to emerging technologies such as storage and distributed energy generation uh, resources. Much of the Commission's work on these issues has been bipartisan, and credit to Commissioner Chatterjee for his leadership uh, on these orders. So Commissioner Glick or Commissioner Chatterjee, can you provide us an update on the implementation of Orders 841 and 2222? So with regard to 841, we're, in the current, we're currently in the compliance process, so we're, uh, we've had a number of proposals from the various RTOs around the country. Uh, we're, we're actually nearing the, the end of the compliance process there. Um, it's a little too soon to tell. I, we expect there's going to be substantial additional investments uh, in storage, but I think we're waiting for the compliance process to conclude. In order 2222, with regard to distributed energy resources, that, that compliance process is actually just beginning. So again, a little too soon, but a lot of folks suggest there's going to be significant investments in those technologies. And how are um, RTOs beginning to respond to the orders, and have they been successful in driving market design changes to enable these technologies to compete fully? A number of RTOs, especially with regard to storage, have submitted um, uh, their compliance programs. Some of some of those programs, some of those processes are still ongoing with regard to proceedings before the commission. But uh, there's definitely been. Uh, I think the the RTOs have. Have tried to amend their market rules in a way that would facilitate those particular projects consistent with what the Commission required them to do. Well, I thank you very much. And with that, um, Mr. Chair, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The Chair now recognizes uh, the ranking, ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Rogers, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good to see everybody. It, hydropower is an essential component of an all of the above energy portfolio. And it's clean, it's renewable, it's reliable. 
in the Pacific Northwest, where, where um, we have an abundant supply of hydropower. Uh, and some of the most, uh, uh, we have reliable energy, we have some of the lowest electricity cost in the country, so, and there's a tremendous opportunity to expand hydropower in our region and across the country. Hydro relicensing, though, or licensing itself, can, can last over a decade, over 10 years, and it costs tens of millions of dollars. And when you compare that to other forms of electricity, generation, uh, it will be significantly less time for others. So Chairman Glick, as the lead agency, what is FERC doing to streamline the licensing process to bring more certainty and predictability to this process? Well, as you mentioned, hydropower provides enormous number of benefits, including uh, zero emissions technologies, low cost, it improves reliability, also increases the ability to uh, efficiently integrate um, uh, weather-dependent uh, renewable energy, such as solar and wind. Um, as our hydro process is, uh, hydro licensing process, Congress has on several occasions made changes to try to improve it, and certainly they've accelerated the process somewhat. Still, it's a very lengthy process because it requires involvement of all a bunch of different agencies. And uh, we don't necessarily have control over what those particular resource agencies do in, in particular part of the process. I would say with regard, and, 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 and under your leadership, I know Congress passed the legislation a couple years ago on, on non-hydropower dam, not non dams that are currently are not hydropowered, try to develop there. I think we've had estimates from the Department of Energy that you can get an additional 50 gigawatts of, of, of hydropower just if you develop power at, at non-power dams. So we, pursuant to the legislation, we've issued regulations that would essentially help facilitate a, a much more speedy process with a name of two years uh, to actually to, li to license those particular projects. Okay, those were the smaller projects. Yes. Um, the number of hydropower projects requiring federal re relicensing is set to double in the coming decade. So what steps is FERC taking to improve and streamline the licensing process to prevent unnecessary delays? So, uh, I, as I think we've, we've, over the years, we've actually tried to improve the process, try to bring in other agencies. I mentioned earlier, I think that it would be helpful to have additional authority from Congress to enable the resource agencies to participate in our particular proceedings, um, uh, and so they're not considered ex parte communications. Um, uh, but uh, uh, we, we, we've had a number of um, improvements over the years, mi minor improvements, but I think the process is still way too long. Well, I think it's uh, important to strengthen the licensing process and remove unnecessary licensing and market barriers to next generation hydropower technologies. I'd like to ask if you would commit to working with Congress to make improvements to the licensing process and barriers to advanced hydropower deployment. Absolutely, we definitely Thank you. do that. Many current congressional and administrative administration proposals appear to involve one size fits all clean electricity mandates to decarbonize the grid at a rapid pace. National mandates, I believe, are really going to harm regions with different energy mixes. The American Southeast, for example, also has low electricity prices, in part because of abundant fossil energy, coal and, and gas, as well as nuclear, and a good record on reliability. Imposing national mandates may intensify reliability risk and raise energy burdens on people in areas across the country, including the Southwest. So to Mr. Mr. Christie and Mr. Danley, I was struck by uh, your testimony about looking at after rate payer interest and the role of reliable, affordable energy. So would you just both speak to how you approach FERC's mission and the interest of rate payers and state regulators in your regulation of markets and transmission and the challenges that you see? I'll let Mr. Danley go first. He outranks me. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, I appreciate the question. Um, the, the, we, we have to keep in mind that regardless of what part FERC plays in, in what has been described today as the transition of the electric system, fundamentally what FERC's duties are, are to be a, a, an economic regulator. Section 205 of the Power Act, of the Federal Power Act, specifies that rates have to be just and reasonable. And it is with that, that fundamental purpose that all of our actions have to be taken. Um, if a fe federal mandates come down, if Congress decrees that particular programs will be available, whether they're through incentives or spending or, or, or particular methods by which FERC has to discharge its duties, we'll, of course, act with alacrity to follow those congressional mandates. But right, the, as the law stands today, we have to look out for great payer interests when we set our wholesale rates. Okay, thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. General Lady Newsman, <laughs> the chairman of recognizing the gentleman 
from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I want to thank you and the ranking member for holding the hearing today, and thank our witnesses and uh, Commissioner Chat Chatterjee. Thank you for your service uh, on the commission, and, and uh, we all wish you well. Uh, as we continue to decarbonize the electric grid, I hope FERC will continue to be proactive and flexible in its approach to building out a grid with more distributed resources and in recognizing the benefits of innovative technologies. Uh, I'm also encouraged by FERC's efforts to finally establish an Office of Public Participation, as well as your efforts to prepare for and combat cyber attacks on our energy infrastructure. This is of vital importance, and I'm glad that FERC, along with this committee, is committed to ensuring the safety of our energy systems. Uh, Chairman Glick, FERC has done a great job keeping pace with technological advancement in the energy storage industry with Order 841 and Order 2222. However, some power market operators have asked for delays in compliance with both orders. And while I certainly don't want to impact system reliability by rushing changes, it's not clear to me whether the market operators are actually dedicating the needed resources to be compliant. Uh, what do you plan to do if market operators fail to meet these compliance deadlines? Do, do you think these delays are warranted? In some cases, the RTOs have come to us and said that they need to make significant changes in their software, and then sometimes it takes, it takes some time to do that, and we've, in, in some cases, granted extensions. But to the extent that we don't believe uh, the, the, the extension requests are warranted in terms of the, the time that's requested, we've, we've actually denied some. Thank you. Uh, Long-duration energy storage, like zinc air batteries manufactured in my district by EOS Energy Storage, are going to be part of the electric system in the future. Uh, even after Order 841, I'm hearing concerns from industry members that wholesale power market design still doesn't value the reliability contributions of energy storage. Can you tell me what FERC is doing to examine continuing regulatory barriers to storage? I agree with you. I think that our market designs were established under a different set of resource mix, and um, in, in particular, our ancillary services markets don't necessarily value that the benefits that flexible generation provides. We know that we're going to have a significant amount of both uh, intermittent solar and intermittent wind generation on the grid, but we, uh, that means we're going to need additional flexible resources to deal with that intermittency. The problem is we don't necessarily value, we don't provide value, we don't compensate uh, resources for that type of value. So I think storage facilities are the perfect example. So we actually have a proceeding underway. We have a technical conference coming up in a couple of weeks on this very issue uh, to examine potential changes to our ancillary services and energy markets to address the, the, the need to reward and incentivize flexibility. Thank you. Um, let me ask you, FERC recently received reports from PJM and other power markets on how their rules address integrated storage and generation resources, uh, also known as hybrid resources. Do you think that updating the rules for hybrid resources is a priority? We, we have an ongoing proceeding to do just that. And under when, when Commissioner Chatterjee was the chair of the commission, we had a technical conference on this very issue. It's a very important issue. As I mentioned before, our role is to get rid of barriers to these newer technologies. That's one of our important roles. And I think hybrid technologies is one. What we're looking at the comments that were received in that docket right now and trying to figure out what to do next. But I agree that we need to, we need to address some of the market um, disincentives to hybrid technologies. Glad to hear that. Uh, Commissioner Clements, uh, as I mentioned, I'm pleased that FERC is finally creating an Office of Public Participation. What specifically does FERC intend to do to ensure that the public and especially affected landholders have the ability to share their thoughts and be involved in decision making? Will you hold, you know, community-based meetings or provide a guide with clear explanation of relevant terms or employ field officers to liaison with landowners over specific pipeline issues? What are some of the things that that you're going to be doing in that process. Thank you, Representative Doyle. Hopefully all of the above. Um, I, I know many members of this committee have done good work on, on public access, and certainly you have a perspective on landowner concerns. By providing an access point at the commission that provides education, neutral information about how to participate in proceedings, those landowners, communities, people who are implicated by either infrastructure decisions the commission makes or by rate decisions the commission makes have the ability to understand how to get into the docket. Once they're in the docket, then their voices are on the record, they're heard, and the commission's decisions will then be more in well-informed, therefore more durable uh, and less vulnerable to litigation. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlemen, you 
back, loud and chestnut, the chairman recognizes the gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. McKinley, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to change horses just a little bit on this. There was an article came out today from E&E &E News uh, talking about the, the decision that you all made back in March with the Northern, Ga Northern Natural Gas. Uh, uh, and it says, that it, the, in part, it says it took an unprecedented step earlier this year in assessing a proposed natural gas pipeline affecting climate change for the first time ever. Uh, and I read the 45-page uh, report since that, and, and I looked at, there were a couple of remarks that were made in there that I thought uh, they were interesting. Uh, I think in part it was Chatterjee. Uh, Commissioner, uh, you said that FERC is not an environmental regulator. We have neither the expertise nor the authority to weigh in on how to best curb emissions. And Danley, Commissioner Danley said, whether project emissions will have a significant effect on climate change is not within our expertise of the FEC, uh, at FERC. The regulation of air emissions, including greenhouse gas emissions, is assigned to the Clean Air Act, not the national, the NGA, excuse me, not the NGA, and that authority is relegated to the EPA, not FERC. So I, I'm curious if, by taking this unprecedented action, I'm assuming by extension, you could deny a pipeline to be constructed. And so, so my, my question with that would be, maybe it's back to you, uh, Chairman Glick. Um, if that's true, that you could, what level, what level of CO2 emissions is going to be acceptable from a natural gas power, power plant? Thank you very much for the question, Mr. McKinley. Um, with, with regard to uh, the, Na the Natural Gas Act, we are required to make two findings in order to certificate a uh, Just please, just okay. what was, what's the level? What, because you can, you can determine that it makes a significant increase in emissions. So therefore, you're going to deny the pipeline. So I'm trying to figure, what is, I don't, since you don't know it, everything I've read so far, you don't have a determination, you don't have metrics on that. What is it that you think would be the appropriate level of CO2 emissions out of a, power, a gas-fired power plant that would allow you to approve a, the, a pipeline. So the, the DC Circuit has twice told us that we actually have to assess these reasonably foreseeable greenhouse gas emissions, so we're trying to do that. Obviously, we have disagreements among the commissioners as to what level might be significant. From my perspective, I don't want to prejudge the matter because it's currently being litigated at, at FERC. I would just say that, uh, again, we, we, we actually examine all sorts of environmental issues as opposed to a proposed pipeline, and including other emissions issues with NOx and SOx, for instance. And so we, we actually have the ability, and not only that, more importantly, we have the, what the so, courts have told so us. You're saying the other, the other two commissioners misspoke by saying that you didn't have the expertise? Uh, yes, I disagree with that. We actually have okay, the expertise. That's fine. That's fine. You, yes. you, you have split, the first, uh, split your panel. Uh, so now my question would be, since in West Virginia and other states uh, that are trying to sh get involved in uh, LNG exports, uh, how will you judge that uh, in a pipeline that's LNG to be exported to another nation? Where are you, are you going to, do you have the framework? The metric, so what are the metrics you're gonna use to measure whether or not that, that gas in an LNG pipeline to England, for example, could you disapprove that if you think they're going to burn our natural gas in England inappropriately? The, the courts have ruled that we don't have authority to look at downstream emissions with regard to LNG facilities. That's for the Department of Energy to judge. Okay. So that doesn't come in. So I, I, the other part of this is, I guess in closing quickly, is I thought our whole mission here was to try to find ways of reducing CO2 emissions so that we could teach China, India, Indonesia and others, uh, how, to, how to clean up their environment. Since we know that 23 of the 25 worst cities in emissions are coming from those, these, those Asian nations. So by virtue of us stopping gas pipelines in America, by using a very subjective determination that has not yet been, you're, you can say you're already disagreeing with two of your members. So if, if that's, what are we gonna export? How are we going to teach India, China? Are, they, are we going to tell them they have to shut off their gas pipelines too? Is, I, don't know whether, I don't know whether this is a transferable technology. 
This seems like more a bureaucratic issue. Well, again, I, I, that's the Department of Energy to decide whether it's in the public interest. I would say, though, Mr. McKinley and I agree that when we, we actually consider the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the project, we need to consider it on a net basis. So, for instance, if that pipeline is actually helping to reduce emissions by shutting down an older coal plant, for instance, or something like that, we need to net that out and take that into account as well in, tar, in terms of our analysis. That's my belief. The Commission still is coming up with its framework for, for, for figuring this all out. Mr. Chairman, I, I yield back. I'm sorry, I went over time. So I guess I'll recognize myself since I was the next one in line. All right. Uh, the chair can't re <clears throat> recognize Mr. McNerney for five minutes. Well, I thank the chair. Uh, I thank the commissioners for your testimony and for your service uh, in this uh, critical industry. Uh, extreme weather events have gotten more common across the country and grid operators have struggled to deliver reliable power to its customers in its 2021 uh, summer reliability assessment, NERC found that California is at the highest risk in energy emergencies in the country due to increased threats of wildfires, extreme heat, and drought. Uh, Chairman Glick, uh, how should existing NERC reliability standards be updated uh, to effectively address the threat of climate change and extreme weather events? So I think, I think that you, that's the exact point. I think we need to uh, address our reliability standards and modernize them to take into account what we know is going to be increasingly um, a difficult weather. And I'll give you one example. You know, last week or two weeks ago, there was uh, there's still an ongoing big fire in, in, in Oregon, but the results of that fire took out the California Inter Oregon Intertie for a while. That brought in 4,000 megawatts of power from the Northwest into California, which California is very reliant on during the summer uh, in most cases. And so we need to actually figure out what the weather situation is, is, is like. Not, uh, some of our standards were based on weather from 20 years ago, 30 years ago predictions, and I think it's clear that it's going to get a lot worse. So I think we need to update the standards, and I know NERC is looking at that as well. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Clemens, uh, what information gaps still exist in assessing the vulnerabilities of our bulk power system to extreme weather and in developing appropriate action plans to prepare uh, to respond to emergency con conditions like those? Thank you, Representative, for the question. I think we're learning as we go, and we've learned a great deal, unfortunately, from the recent events in Texas and the central U.S., as well as in the experiences in the West, both beginning of this summer and last summer. And the two takeaways uh, from my perspective, one is that you have to help your neighbors. Inter-regional transmission is a critical component of, of resilience in these emergency conditions. It's been said, and it's worth saying again, that in the Texas event, we had the Mid-Atlantic region sharing PJM, sharing power with the Midwestern region, MISO. MISO sharing power with the Central Plains region, SPP. And then Texas unable to be the next in line because there was a lack of interregional connection. The second lesson is that demand side resources are a critical component of ensuring resilience. You know, American citizens are willing to uh, scale back on their, on their use of electricity and that should be systematized. They should be able to get paid for providing that service to ensure resilience. Thank you. As you mentioned, FERC has, been, has begun to remove some of the barriers uh, to participation in the wholesale markets for newer technologies like energy storage and distributed energy systems. Uh, what, FERC, uh, what is FERC doing to encourage utilities to meet the reliability challenges with forward-looking technology solutions, and how is FERC ensuring the storage and distributed energy are being compensated for properly? That's kind of a follow-up question on Mr. Doyle's question, but go ahead. Sure, uh, Representative, thanks. You, you, you implied the answer uh, on, on one part, which is that um, former Chairman Chatterjee and now Chairman Glick have done a great job through these, these rules in opening wholesale markets to participation by these resources. On the reliability front, certainly there's still work to do, but there's a tremendous potential in these demand side resources to contribute to system reliability to bring benefits uh, across the system. Well, thank you. Um, Chairman Glick, what future steps does FERC have planned to take action on grid resilience and reliability? 
So we had a, a, a two-day technical conference recently to address weather-related issues and its impact on grid resiliency. We, we're actually about to release a number of questions in the docket. The next step is to, to decide. We need to decide as a commission whether we move forward with the, some sort of rulemaking or policy statement. But we still have to. Uh, we're still making our way through the. We will be making our way through the comments that are submitted in that docket. Well, I hope to encourage FERC to to build on that on that work. Um, I, I am concerned about the increase in cyber attacks, as I think everybody here is. Um, and uh, Chairman Glick, what proactive steps is FERC taking to protect the bulk power system from cyber attacks, and how is FERC working with other federal agencies to do that? So in addition to the mandatory reliability uh, standard authority that we share with NERC, we uh, constantly are in constant communications with the Department of Energy, CISA, uh, Homeland Security, TSA, and a whole variety of other agencies in terms of communicating with them and other agencies as to various threats. Um, but in particular, one area that I think I would like to see additional work on and I, I, I'm hoping to push forward in terms of a rulemaking process is on the issue of um, the supply chain. Uh, as we saw in the solar winds example, whether it be software or other supply chain matters, supply chain is not safe enough currently in terms of protected from cybersecurity threats. And uh, we have a, currently we have a rule that says the utilities have to have a plan to address uh, the supply chain. I think we need to go forward with that and, and implement specific standards on that particular topic. Thank you. Another thing we need to address really is the uh, ability of, of utility companies to share information with the federal government on, on, on uh, classified information. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kinsinger, for five minutes. The chair. No see Mr. Kinsinger on the screen. The chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Griffith for five minutes. Thank you, very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it greatly. This is um, this is going to be one of my favorite hearings of all time uh, because uh, probably close to 20 years ago, uh, Commissioner Christie and I were still hanging out on the sixth floor of the General Assembly Building in the Virginia. Uh, legislature, he was giving us wise counsel, and I was trying to act on it uh, from time to time. Uh, but uh, it's good to see you here, Commissioner Christie, and thank you for your work 17 years on the uh, Virginia State uh, uh, Commission, uh, and we greatly appreciate that work. And so I, I, one thing I don't really remember is I thought uh, my recollection is you came from rural Virginia originally. Where, where, were, where was your hometown? Uh, West Virginia, which is all rural. Okay, there you go. He was you know, McKinley has has stepped out for a minute, but right. uh, no, he can't correct me. So. Yeah, so he can't correct you. But uh, we we appreciate you being here today. One of the things that I've been concerned about is we've been looking at uh, all of the new plans and the short timeline that the administration has placed on getting us to a significant amount of renewable energy and, in fact, eliminating uh, carbon from our energy pool to provide electricity has been the siting that has been mentioned earlier and the transmission. And evidence at previous hearings has been is that we're going to need a lot of high power transmission lines to uh, crisscross the country to take uh, this power from the renewables uh, to where the energy is actually needed. And coming from rural Virginia or rural West Virginia, one of the concerns is are they going to be bringing those power lines through our neighborhood and, and what are the particulars going to be? And I'm glad that we have Heard some evidence today that there's going to be an ability for landowners to say some things. But we have heard that it's going to take, uh, it could take, you know, as, uh, greater than 30 years by the time you finish all the regulations and the siting and the planning and so forth to get it done. And then another witness came in and said, well, we can shortcut that by, by putting these transmission lines in existing right-of-ways. So I ask you, is it actually practical to consider uh, railroad right-of-ways for purposes of a high-voltage power line, uh, highways, and last but not least, uh, adding new additional power lines in existing power line easements. Those were three ideas that were presented to the committee. I did not find that to be uh, uh, plausible, but I want to hear from the experts, and you've been doing this for a long time. Tell me. Uh, well, Congressman Griffith, let me uh, address... Um, transmission construction this way. And I've sat on literally scores well over 100 transmission line cases in Virginia. And I take issue with the statement made earlier that the obstacle to building uh, transmission lines are state regulators, that they need to get off the dime. They're not on the dime. 
as a state regulator who said on many cases, I can tell you what you look for in a state uh, case is first of all, you look to see whether the transmission line is needed. Consumers should not pay for lines that are not needed. So state regulators are gonna look at whether the line is needed. Then you're gonna look at whether the line is at reasonable cost because consumers shouldn't pay more than the, the, the reasonable cost for the, for the line. And then you look at the route and you ask about, is it practical to put, it, put a, a transmission line through a railroad right of way or highway right of way or old, uh, and the question is, of course, is the facts of each case. I mean, if you're talking about a 765 kV, that's probably not gonna go down a railroad right away or a highway right away, because a 765 kV is an extremely big transmission line. And also, if you're gonna run it through greenfield development, you're gonna use a lot of eminent domain and it's gonna be extremely expensive. And I think state regulators are well suited to make those evaluations in individual cases. Whether you're in an RTO or you're not in an RTO, even if the RTO puts a proposed line into a into what they call their regional transmission plan. In PJM, it was called the RTEP. The state regulators still are gonna evaluate it. We did it many times in Virginia. The largest single regional line in PJM, I think uh, I'm right, the largest single regional line in PJM is the trail line, which we approved in Virginia. We were not the obstacle to, to that. We approved it and it got built. So state regulators are gonna evaluate these lines based upon number one, are they needed? And, and this is a critically important point, both state and federal. Transmission lines should be built if they're needed. And it's not just a question of the routing. It's a question of need because consumers shouldn't pay for something that doesn't and, meet a need requirement. The time is just about up. So let me, let me just say this. I agree with you that it needs to be needed. And you also mentioned earlier in your testimony it, it depends on cost. I mean, is it really social justice to run the price up on electricity on a district like that I represent, which is one of the economically most challenged districts in the country, 422 with latest data out of 435 for take-home pay. Is that really social justice to suddenly route a whole lot of new lines through there or to make their prices go up? You got seven seconds. Well, I'm not gonna comment on what social justice. I think that's a, a, a different topic for this hearing, but I will say this. I just don't think as a, as a former state regulator and a current federal regulator, consumers should only pay for, for any infrastructure that is needed to serve them with electricity. I think that's built into the utility regulation. And I think that's what's fair is, is consumers should only pay for what's needed. All right, I appreciate it. I yield back, Mr. Chairman, thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the general lady from Washington State, Ms. Schreier, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to our witnesses today. My question is going to be kind of along the lines of what we've been talking about with transmission lines and balancing cost and uh, environmental protection. So um, Commissioner Clements, last month my state experienced the second hottest June on record uh, that resulted in dangerous conditions and loss of life. And this heat and increasingly dangerous wildfires that are happening every year now have worsened because of climate change. And so that is why, of course, we are prioritizing and looking to accelerate the shift away from greenhouse gas generating sources of power to prevent the worst consequences of climate change. And so this shift to renewables, as we've been discussing, will require a resilient grid, a redundant grid that can distribute energy from where it's produced to wherever the demand is high and thus the need for these high voltage transmission lines so, um, Commissioner Clements, as environmental concerns continue to grow, I'm wondering how you're going to balance kind of traditional environmental protection, uh, wetlands, fields, habitats, with speeding up the decision-making process so you can fulfill the role that you have in citing these new transmission lines, which will, in fact, protect our natural environment. Thank you, Representative, for the question. A resilient grid requires investment before we even talk about what types of resources are going to connect to the system on the other end of the line. A lot of the lines that, that protect our, uh, provide service to our customers across the country today were built in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and are old. And so the question is, what kind of investment are we going to make? Because customers ultimately will pay for that investment. And, and to, to your question, Representative, paying for, from a forward-looking perspective, lines that will bring the benefits of both resilience in the face of these unfortunate conditions you've just described, as well as the double benefit of providing interconnection for these low cost resources on the other end of the line are really valuable. Of course, states have a primary siting authority over 
uh, over transmission development. And one thing that Chairman Glick has done already is to establish a task force with the states that we as a commission has approved to help address some of these tough issues. There are, states should have their perspectives heard. A, there is also a national interest in ensuring that some of these bigger lines get built in a cost-effective way so that customers across states have the ability to benefit. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. You know, I wanted to shift kind of on that topic of states and their role in all of this to Commissioner Christie, because you spoke about a couple things, that like reliability and affordability are your key priorities, and you discussed using, you know, really judicious placement of transmission lines, you know, only when they're needed and where they're needed to address this. I was wondering if you could tell us more about FERC's strategy to to keep energy transmission costs affordable as these changes are made. And I mean, maybe while you're talking about how to balance, you know, costs and get customer uh, support, if you could talk about whether there is a general consensus about which transmission lines are needed and where. Thank you again. When you look at a transmission line case, and let's get it down to an individual case level, the, the first question in the case is going to be, is this line needed? Is it needed to fix a reliability problem? Is it needed to relieve a congestion problem? What is the need that justifies this transmission line? And then the next thing you get to is you get to the cost. Is it, is it at reasonable cost? So the planners play a huge role in this. And of course, in, a, in the United States, you're either in an RTO or you're in a non-RTO. In, in an RTO, they have transmission planners and they have criteria that they use to determine what uh, uh, regional lines are going to be recommended. And I know speaking from experience in, in PJM, the two criteria are gonna be reliability or relieve congestion. And those are gonna be the two primary criteria. And I think from FERC's standpoint, our job is to look at the criteria that the RTOs use and, and make sure that those criteria actually serve consumers, because I think at the end of the day, that's what this is about. It's about serving consumers and providing them with the power that they need and doing it at, at, at a cost which is not more than, than necessary. In a non-RTO, of so course, uh, like, I'm sorry, I ran out of time. The, the crux, sorry, the crux of this, just in the last few seconds here, is sort of, you know, there's reliability now with the sources that we have now, and then there's reliability in the future when we have more reliance on, uh, on, on renewables, more distance traveled, interstate, interregion, and more demand for electricity. And you have to, I can be thinking forward. Any last comment on that? Yeah, the generation mix is changing, and so transmission planning needs to take that into account. I mean, it doesn't change the criteria, it just changes the facts of the generation mix, and the planners have to take that into account. You still get back to whether a, an individual transmission line is needed, and that's ultimately going to be a decision which is going to come down to a state regulator making a decision whether to issue a CPC in or not. And, and that's where the authority is, and, actually, and I think state regulators play a great role in that. Thank you. I apologize for going over time. You'll back. Generally, you have met the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Johnson, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to the commissioners for, uh, for being here with us today. Today, we're hearing about the commission performing its work to protect America's public interest, especially the siting and permitting of pipeline and liquefied natural gas facilities. Uh, Commissioner Glick, you mentioned in your testimony that FERC's statutory duty under the Natural Gas Act is to determine whether a project is, in fact, in the American people's best interest. However, with the Biden administration's green lighting of Nord Stream 2, the disdain for America's domestic pipeline infrastructure and support for radical rush decarbonization, the president and his allies are actually serving a very different public interest, the public interest of Vladimir Putin's Russia. This is why FERC doing its job and doing its job right is so important, and hopefully the oversight that we're conducting today will make that clear. Uh, just a real Introductory question, uh, Commissioner Glick, do you support expanding U.S. LNG exports? That's really a matter for the Department of Energy to determine. No, I, I, I didn't will say, ask you. I, I, will say, I, I know who it, whose job it is to approve it, but under your own testimony, you have to look out for America's best interest under the Natural Gas Act. So do you support 
U.S. LNG export expansion? On a case-by-case -case basis, I think there are LNG okay, exports great. that serve the public interest. I'll yeah. take that as a yes. Thank you. Well, I certainly support expanding the exports. In fact, I urge our committee to take up my legislation, the Unlocking Our Domestic LNG Potential Act, which would cut Washington red tape and ease the process for American producers to e export more LNG around the world, especially to Europe. This not only supports jobs here at home, but also projects American economic and energy power abroad, something that the Biden administration has failed to grasp, ceding ground to Putin's quest to expand his influence throughout Europe instead. Speaking of Putin's influence and Russian natural gas, according to a report from DOE's Natural Energy Technology Lab, the life cycle emissions of Russian <laughs> gas is 41% higher than American LNG exports that are delivered to Europe. So, Commissioner Glick, back to you again. You said that the Commission may consider climate change in proposed projects, and the Biden administration claims that reducing carbon emissions is a top priority. Will you weigh the climate benefits when reviewing U.S. LNG export projects? We don't have the authority to do that. That's the Department of Energy. You, you don't, uh, you don't, in your, <coughs> in your looking uh, at what's in America's best interest. When we, when we review a, a LNG project, uh, when we cite an LNG project, we only can look at direct emissions. We can't look at the emissions impact downstream. The courts have told us that's for the Department of Energy, not for. But you said that the commission may consider climate change in proposed projects. So how can you do it? Do you just do it when you feel like doing it, or do you not do it all the time? No, we have, we have authority over natural gas interstate pipelines and an LNG facility. So will you consider climate? Uh, will you s consider climate benefits when reviewing those LNG export projects? We can't. Can, we're not. The courts have, do not allow us to consider benefits overseas. If you want to say benefits in, in domestic, no. Benefits, but the exporting starts here in America, and that has to be produces produced here in America. So. The exporting starts here. So I, I think I'm hearing you say yes. I understand your question, Mr. Johnson. We just don't have authority to consider that. That's well, sure you do. Energy. You just don't want to answer that. Let me ask you this. Will you weigh the energy security and domestic economic benefits when reviewing LNG uh, export projects? Um, yes, we have the authority okay, to, look, to look at domestic benefits. Commissioners Chatterjee, Danley, and Christie, can you give us some quick thoughts on the importance of U.S. LNG exports. Uh, Commissioner Chatterjee, let's yeah. start with you. Thank you, Congressman Johnson. Uh, this was something that we took very seriously during my time leading the agency. Um, there was a glut of applications. I was worried that we might not be able to get through them. So working with staff and my colleagues, we removed some duplicative regulations and actually over the course of the past four years have approved 14 LNG export facilities that would fulfill what you have said. Okay. Positive economic benefits in the U.S., positive geopolitical implications as a counterweight to Russia, and positive environmental benefits reducing global carbon emissions. Great. Commissioner Daniel. I think it is not an overstatement to say that um, America's LNG terminals are geostrategic assets and that they are among the most important pieces of infrastructure that the United States has permitted. And the benefits that it offers large-scale LNG export to the well-being of people overseas can hardly be overstated. Okay, and Christy. Federal law favors gentlemen, LNG exports and favors. Smart. Time's up. Sure. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Gentlemen, from Colorado, you have five minutes. Mr. Chair, now recognizing the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Butterfield, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's, it's good to see you and to see all of our colleagues today. Uh, let me say thank you to our witnesses for your testimony. Thank you for the incredible work that each of you does on the commission. Uh, Chairman Glick, earlier this Congress, I introduced H.R. 3979, the Protecting Natural Gas Consumers from Overcharges Act, and I introduced this along with my good friend and, and colleague, Billy Long. Uh, this bill would amend Section 5 of the Natural Gas Act to give FERC 
refund authority in cases where natural gas transmission pipelines are charging their customers unfair rates. Under Section 206 of the Federal Power Act, FERC can examine the rates charged by an electric transmission entity and order refunds if they were found to be unjust and unreasonable. Unfortunately, the Natural Gas Act does not offer such protection for natural gas consumers, despite the fact that in 2019, the 10 most profitable pipelines received $1.1 billion in overcharges from their customers. <clears throat> and so our bill will create parity for electrical transmission and natural gas customers by giving you, by giving FERC the authority to order pipelines to refund overcharges. Under the bill, consumers will be protected from unfair charges regardless of whether they utilize electrical or natural gas, natural gas utilities. Uh, several days ago on July 13th, I sent the chairman, you, a letter. Uh, I also sent a copy to the other commissioners uh, regarding the bill, and my staff has informed me today that your office has provided a response, and thank you, thank you so very much. And so, Mr. Chairman, I would like to, to submit the response letter uh, from the commissioner for the record, if I might. <clears throat> thank you. Having reviewed our legislation, Mr. Chairman, do you agree that Congress should amend the, the NGA uh, so FERC can grant refunds in these cases? Thank you, Mr. Butterfield. I do agree. Uh, we, you know, we have the responsibility to protect consumers, whether it be consumers on the electric side or consumers of interstate natural gas pipelines, and not having that refund authority inhibits us from being able to fully protect consumers. So I would support us having the same refund authority that we do on the electric side. Well, let me take you a step further. Do, do you think it is fair that natural gas consumers are not protected while electric users are? It seems to be uh, unfair. No, I think it's not fair currently. All right, here's my final question. How do unfair overcharges impact natural gas consumers like my constituents and Mr. Johnson and others who have talked, uh, constituents who, and Mr. Griffith, uh, who rely on natural gas for cooking and heating? Do these charges ultimately lead to higher, higher rates? They do, they ultimately get passed on. We have the authority to review whether pipeline rates are just and reasonable. And there are cases where we found that pipelines have been charging excessively, excessive amounts beyond just and reasonable rates. And meanwhile, we haven't been able to do anything about it. So the pipeline company uh, does, uh, uh, the pipeline company charges essentially the shippers of natural gas for those excess amounts and those, those shippers end up passing those, uh, those rates on to consumers. Thank you, Chairman Glick. I'm gonna yield back in just a moment. Uh, were your answers to, uh, to Mr. Johnson a moment ago complete, or did you need some time to, to expand on, on a previous answer? Thank you, Mr. Butterfield. I, generally, uh, they were complete. I just wanted to make the point that, I, that we do have the authority and the responsibility to look at greenhouse gas emissions from a domestic perspective on LNG projects with regard to um, uh, when, when the project is built and the project is operating. But it's the Department of Energy, as the courts have told us many times, not FERC, that can only look at greenhouse gas emissions overseas in terms of the, the downstream impacts of a particular LNG facility. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair for the record noted that the gentleman asked for unanimous consent to enter into uh, the record a letter. Uh, and uh, I want to make sure that I didn't hear any objections, so the letter is uh, entered into the record. Um, not Chair, now I recognize Mr. Mushan for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the commissioners for being here today and at this crucial time as we see the transitioning uh, type of energy um, that we're developing here in our country. I'm, look, I'm a strong supporter of an all of the above energy approach. We need to ensure that policy decisions allow customers to have options when it comes to electricity to keep costs down and domestic options abundant. There's a couple of things I want, though, in the context of this hearing, I want to point out as, as for example, in, in California, wildfires generate this CO2 generated from wildfires. And essentially, we're not addressing any of our forest management issues and blaming it all on climate change, ironically, for environmental reasons. But here's some data from the San Francisco Chronicle in 2018. Wildfires in California generated 111.7 
million metric tons of CO2 compared with 169.2 million metric tons for the transportation industry. And that amount generated by wildfires is 25% more than the state's annual emissions from fossil fuels. Yet we're not addressing, we're not doing anything to address it, we're just blaming it on, on climate change. And I'm not saying there's not a component of that. Interestingly, that's only about 15 per 20, or to 20% of the CO2 emissions coming from Amazon wildfires in the Amazon forest, which of course we have no control over. And then uh, let's consider the fact the Earth is moving at about 67,000 miles per hour around the sun, rotating at 1,000 miles per hour, and our solar system whirls around the center of our galaxy at 490,000 miles per hour. So the point I want to make is, let's put all this in context and quit talking about political talking points here and look at the facts. Again, I support an all-of-the-above approach to energy in our country. And the geopolitics, as outlined by Mr. Johnson, is critical unless we want to cut off our nose to spite our face. We're allowing Vladimir Putin to control the world's natural gas industry. Seriously? Eastern Europe are begging, literally begging us for uh, energy. I've been there, I know. They're begging us for energy because until they get it from us and our allies, they're dependent on the Russians. Why do you think the Russians are in Ukraine? For their health? So I just want to get that out there. In 2018, this committee passed a package of hydro power permitting bills, which included my bill, H.R. 2872, the Promoting Hydropower Development at Existing Non-Power Dams Act, and that was signed into law by the president. The purpose of the bill was to create a two-year licensing process to electrify existing non-power dams, of which there's a lot more than you would think. Uh, Chairman Glick, do you support the expansion of hydropower? I do, and the Department of Energy recently estimated that there could be an extra 50, 50 gigawatts of additional hydropower capacity, and I think that's going to be a very important component of our generation mix going forward. I, I would agree. I think we have to utilize all of, as I said, I'm, I believe in the all, of, all of the above approach. Even my, my district in Indiana has every coal mine in the state. My dad was a coal miner, but I, but I support all of these things. How, how is the new two-year expedited licensing process for existing non-power dams working out? We've implemented the regulations, and uh, uh, we, we've had a few uh, applications uh, since then. Uh, they're still making a way through the process, but I would say that the goal of two years is a, is, is a laudable goal and something I think we strive for every day. We certainly had a pilot program even before the legislation passed that achieved yeah. a two-year. It's tight, I understand. Yeah, I, but I think one of the requirements under the rulemaking is that it, basically these companies have to come with us with a, basically a, a completed application process, and so we're working with them right now to try to expedite yeah. that. I understand. And uh, what additional steps can we take to streamline the process and for these non-powered dams? Well, I, I think if anything, we have, I think we have to make let, let the existing process kind of work out. It's a little bit uh, too soon to really to really tell whether the additional changes need to be made. I think we have to wait a couple of years to see how this the process okay. works its way through. Because uh, as was outlined by another member, believe it or not, the some in the environmental community want to remove all the dams and not use hydropower, which seems kind of Contraindicate, you know, not contraindicates, but op the opposite of what you, know, you would expect people to be promoting. Um, lastly, can you comment on the ban on imports of solar panels from China's Xinjiang forced labor camps, and how that how that might affect the uh, uh, the U.S. solar industry? Um, I can get you an answer for the record. I'm not necessarily an expert at our particular trade policy, although I'm obviously aware of the situation. Okay, thanks. Yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman lady from California, Ms. Mazzui, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for convening this hearing. And commissioners, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. FERC is a crucial agency to fulfill our country's goals to provide cleaner, affordable, and reliable energy while building stronger, more resilient communities in light of the ever-growing th threats of the climate crisis. Now, due to intensified extreme weather events in California, we have experienced electricity crises in which electricity demand exceeds supply, and the result is rolling blackouts for some customers. 
We remain concerned about resource adequacy and market planning, especially amid extreme weather that tests the system and frequent calls for energy conservation, which has caused conservation fatigue among consumers. Chairman Glick, what are FERC's key takeaways from the March 2021 Technical Conference on Resource Adequacy? Thank you very much, Ms. Masui. I, I, I agree with you 100% that, that this is obviously an urgent issue. And we did have a technical conference because this isn't just a California issue. It's an issue throughout the entire West. And uh, we see it in the, in the Pacific Northwest. We see it in the Desert Southwest, for instance. And um, the key takeaway for me that the region needs to cooperate. Uh, the region needs to work together. No, no state is an island. Uh, we've seen over the many years, California in the winter was able to bring in its power from the Northwest, and then the, 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 the uh, uh, power came uh, in the Northwest. The Northwest got their power in the, in, in the, uh, in the winter from the Southwest and from California. And um, I, I think what we learned from that particular technical conference is that they're, they're, they're every particular state, every particular subregion of the West is looking at it from their own perspective. And I think we need greater cooperation, and potentially the development of uh, some sort of regional market, whether it be an RTO or something like that, to facilitate planning across the region and hopefully facilitate um, a better, a more uh, uh, resilient resource adequacy. Okay, well, thank you for that. And earlier this year, President Biden announced his plan to achieve 100% carbon-free electricity by 2035, an ambitious but necessary goal. I am proud that my home state of California and my local municipal utility company, SMUG, have long been champions of carbon free electricity goals. California set a renewable portfolio standard that will require 60% renewable energy by 2030. And SMUG is the first utility company in the nation to lay out a comprehensive plan to reach net zero emissions by 2030. To fulfill these ambitious one thing is clear. We will not be able to achieve our clean energy goals without expanding our transmission system. Commissioner Clements, what role should FERC play in addressing transmission, transmission planning reforms that have often hindered the development of large-scale transmission projects needed to achieve local, state, and federal clean energy goals? Thank you, Representative Matsui. I think the Commission has taken a really important first step. There's, there's over time been a series of commission orders that have encouraged transmission development to meet the needs of our country at that time. We are again at that moment, and the uh, advance notice of proposed rulemaking asks a significant number of questions about how to ensure both regional uh, planning processes and interregional planning processes best serve um, the resources that, that the markets and policies are driving, as well as customer resilience and reliability needs. Well, how does the Commission plan to act swiftly to achieve these necessary reforms while also responding to comments from the public? Appreciating the urgency of the need, regulatory processes, as you know, move slowly. Um, I think we are well set up uh, by asking this broad set of questions to take action across all of the issues that have been described really on, on the transmission front, planning, permitting, and paying for transmission. Okay. Um, throughout my time in Congress, I have spearheaded initiatives such as the Clean and Efficient Cars Act and enacted legislation to reauthorize the Diesel Emissions Reduction Act. These efforts will help expedite the transition to light, medium, and heavy-duty electric vehicles and lower carbon emissions and air pollution from the transportation sector. Chairman Glick, how will transportation electrification affect the transmission system, and what actions should Congress take to ensure that FERC can help match the increased electricity demand so our transmission system will meet the challenges of this transition. And you've got 30 seconds. I'll talk quickly. Electrification actually has significant benefits, in, in, including, uh, uh, but uh, significant impacts on the grid as well. So for instance, we're gonna need additional transmission, additional clean generation, clearly. But also, I, I wanna point out that also we can take advantage of uh, electric vehicles, for instance, they could participate in the distributed, distributed energy resource market and uh, discharge their batteries when power is most needed and charge with power, then there's a lot of extra additional power on the grid. And so I think that we, it's not, not just a challenge in terms of the grid, in terms of what we have to, the investments we have to make, but also can provide and improve our resilience and reliability. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The general lady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Walmart, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to the panel for being here. It's good to uh, meet new members coming on. 
it's good to have the opportunity to uh, congratulate you, uh, Chairman Glick, and uh, it's good to have the opportunity to thank you, uh, uh, Commissioner Chatterjee. I got to got to get used to uh, saying it that way. I thank you for your dedicated years of service uh, on this issue. I'd particularly like to highlight your work on PERPA modernization. There weren't many people I could talk to about PERPA that understood it like you at the time. Uh, it's something that I've long championed. Um, and really from the aspect that PERPA did what we wanted it to do. It expanded uh, renewables. It got the big uh, guys and gals into doing things that they should have been doing. And it, in the end, I think it uh, brought about a great opportunity to see reliability and affordability enhanced for the consumer. Order uh, number 872 mirrored many provisions in my bill, the PERPA Modernization Act, uh, by giving states greater flexibility to incorporate current market prices in calculating avoided cost rates, preventing qualified facilities from gaming the one-mile rule and lowering the net uh, threshold for non-discriminatory -discri access to power markets for small power producers. Uh, these are all complex issues, but I have no doubt the work you and Commissioner Danley specifically did to make these changes will help increase competition and bring down electricity costs for ratepayers across the country. And so, uh, Commissioner Chatterjee, um, as you prepare to leave FERC, what more do you think the Commission and Congress can do to ensure PURPA continues to keep pace with the rapidly changing landscape uh, of energy? I think the most important thing that the commission needs to do is keep uh, Order 872 in place. Um, I do agree that uh, the action we took to modernize PURPA, to bring it into alignment with the realities of the 21st century marketplace was the right thing to do. When PURPA was originally conceived, it was a totally different uh, energy landscape than what we see today, and it was a much needed uh, response. Congress uh, instructed us to go back and periodically re revisit our regulations to see where they can be modernized and updated, and uh, I'm proud of the action that we took. But as you noted, uh, I'm departing the commission. There will be a new iteration uh, of the commission going forward, uh, and it is not impossible that a different iteration of the commission could reverse some of the progress we made uh, with Order 872. And so I'm hopeful that you all, using your oversight uh, uh, authority here in the House, as well as your colleagues in the Senate who will be questioning my potential successor, uh, will make sure that the good work we did in Order 872 is maintained going forward and doesn't get reversed and lead to regulatory uncertainty. And another reason to pass my legislation to make it law, <laughs> if we can. Um, thank you. Uh, Chairman Glick, uh, in your dissent to the PURPA modernization rule, if might as well get it out in the open here. Sure. You said you were concerned that FERC was overstepping its jurisdiction. But with all due respect, um, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm concerned that the commission may be vastly overstepping its jurisdiction by viewing all decisions through an environmental lens uh, instead of putting reliability and affordability for the consumer first. As you know, FERC is not an environmental regulator. It's come out today, and it's not a safety regulator. FERC does not have the statutory authority, the budgetary resources, or the expertise to take on those important missions, which are appropriately led by the states, the EPA, and PHMSA. When it comes to pipelines, FERC has two primary statutory uh, obligations. One, uh, I think you would agree to determine whether the project is required by the public convenience and necessity, and two, to take a hard look at the direct, indirect, and cumulative efforts of the proposed project. And so, uh, Chairman Glick, do you believe FERC has the statutory authority, not the ability, but the statutory authority to deny a permit for a pipeline project solely because of climate change concerns? I think we have the authority to determine whether a project is in the public interest, as you mentioned, and the courts have told us that we have to examine greenhouse gas emissions, and the DC Circuit has said we could, in fact, uh, uh, restrict or, or, or not decide not to issue a certificate uh, based on a particular project's impact on the environment. So I think from our perspective, we're just following what the courts have told us to do. But solely for environmental concerns? If, if the environmental concerns, yes, the, uh, the courts have said on numerous occasions that the environmental concerns are significant enough to outweigh the adverse benefits. You can't mitigate those environmental concerns, then you could technically 
um, uh, reject a particular certificate. We haven't done so today. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be awful cautious about that, whether the court case would, would go that far and give that type of latitude for you to do it. And I mean, that's, that's our concern. And, and um, I guess we'll have a chance to talk about it further as I look at the time at some other place, but I would really caution that. So can I, can I just respond quickly? I know your time's up. Um, so FERC has the, the ability to actually, you know, to take a look at the environmental impacts of a proposed project, but we often, in almost all cases, try to mitigate those particular impacts. And that's true for greenhouse gas emissions as well. To the extent we find those emissions are significant, we could, in fact, require the pipeline developer to mitigate the impacts. That's what we do with wetlands and NOx emissions and all sorts of other environmental impacts uh, with regard to proposed pipeline projects. So just because you were to find a particular project that has a significant level of emissions doesn't mean you have to deny the project. Thank you. I yield back. Gentlemen, time has expired. The chair now recognizes the general lady from Florida, Ms. Castor, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Chairman Rush, and thank you to commissioners. Thank you for your public service. Uh, FERC has jurisdiction over two critical strategies to help us avoid the escalating costs and the catastrophic harms of the climate crisis. Uh, one is upgrading and expanding the electric grid. Uh, two is removing the roadblocks to clean energy in wholesale power markets. Uh, both of these strategies create jobs, uh, reduce carbon pollution, clean up the air that we breathe, and uh, will improve the public health. And, and so many people now are awake to the fact that a clean electricity sector is the linchpin to meeting our clean energy goals across the entire economy. Uh, Chairman Glick, I'm encouraged by your leadership and focus on improving transmission siting and the interconnection uh, cost allocation. I've been working on legislation in this area. Uh, one, my transmission siting assistance initiative was included as section 218 in the Clean Future Act, and it would provide technical assistance to states and local communities uh, to help them plan and site the interstate transmission lines. And then two, in June, I introduced the Efficient Grid Interconnection Act, HR 4027, to help families power their homes with affordable and abundant clean energy uh, and, ta and tackled the problem of those traffic jams on, the, uh, on our transmission lines and the electric grid. And thanks to FERC, you all provided some technical assistance there. So Chairman Glick, a recent Department of Energy uh, report found that nearly five times the nation's existing wind and solar capacity is stuck in this traffic jam on the electric grid, these interconnection queues. The average wait time is three and a half years. Uh, can you please explain to, to everyday Americans how uh, busting up these traffic jams, uh, clearing out the inter interconnection queues will help promote competition and lower cost and then improve the public health as well. Thank you, Ms. Castor. You know, as, as we mentioned before, 93% of all the electric generation in the queue, in the interconnection queue right now, is wind and solar. And we know that based on various state policies, based on consumer interest, based on utility programs, there's a lot of extra demand for those particular resources. The problem is those resources are most often located in, in, in relatively remote areas. We have great resources in the United States. They're just located away from where you know, a lot of folks consume energy. And so um, uh, one, of the, one of the problems is that it take, uh, when you get in the interconnection queue, you have to go through a whole variety of engineering studies. It takes forever to get through that queue process. There's so many studies that go on. There's so many competing interests. And, and, and from a, a, it's developed over time. It's just it's taken forever. FERC has on a couple of occasions uh, implemented regulations designed to expedite the process, but we have a long way to go. We still need to speed up the process greatly. But I think once we resolve the cost responsibility for those particular transmission upgrades that are made that facilitate these, these, these uh, particular interconnection facilities, I think, um, uh, that will help, I think that will do the most uh, of any particular measure we could take to expedite the process. And Commissioner Clement, do you agree? I do. I, th I think my hypothesis, which is supported by lots of experts around the country, is that this failure of the regional transmission planning process to look forward, to plan for the needs of this 
really um, emerging interconnection queue is forcing that process to happen in the interconnection queue. So we're trying to do regional and interregional planning through this, through this line, which was never designed to do anything except for connect one resource to the grid. And I think to Chairman Glick's point, the biggest issue on, uh, one of the biggest issues is the, the, the participant funding model, which basically now requires, um, as an analogy, if you, if you buy a new house on a street and you're the last person to buy a house, you have to pave the road for that whole street. You have to pay to pave the road for that whole street. That's how the current uh, process works for paying for interconnection, and that's something that we need to look at. I think you're absolutely right. And then you also highlighted uh, how important it is for these high voltage transmission lines to help us power the future and mitigate all of the, the escalating costs and just catastrophic harms. There's no way to sit here and not understand and watch what is happening across this country and across the globe right now and, and understand the need for drastic action. But we have to do things uh, according to, to, to science and, and fact-based. But clearly, we have, this is America. We have the tools to build these high voltage transmission lines. What else do you think the Congress needs to do? That's absolutely right. I think the challenge is big in terms of the need for interregional and regional transmission development, regardless of, of um, the resource mix that's on the other end of the line, although it all happens to be wind and solar right now. We need resilience, we need reliability, and it runs counter to the American spirit to give up before we've even begun to fight on these issues. I think we have this NOPER out, this advanced NOPER uh, out for public comment and look forward to really processing those, those inputs so that we can get going on these questions. I mean, Mr. Chairman, do we have so many smart innovators out there? Uh, I know you're probably hungry for some of these solutions, on, according to the NOPA. Uh, absolutely. I would say there's one particular area. Young um, ladies, the young ladies' time is expired. Uh, the chair. Thank you uh, very much. We recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Duncan, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks everyone for being here. I know you guys are, are getting tired. You just have a few more to, to endure, so uh, thanks for that. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission's stated mission is to assist customers in obtaining reliable, efficient, and sustainable energy services at a reasonable cost through appropriate regulatory and market means. To fulfill this mission, FERC identifies the following primary goals. I'm going to skip down to number three. To use resources effectively, adequately equipping FERC employees for success and executing responsive and transparent processes that strengthen, strengthen public trust. So I want to bring up a situation that a county in my district has been dealing with for quite some time. Greenwood County has been going back and forth with FERC on the type and construction of an emergency fuse plug at Lake Greenwood Dam. The location of the fuse plug was approved previously by FERC, but the Atlanta Regional FERC Office later determined that if the fuse plug were to be activated, which has not occurred in the entire existence of the lake, and the lake was built in 1935 to 1940, including devastating flooding of 2015, there would be severe damage to the surrounding area. Thus, Lake Greenwood Dam remediation has moved at a glacial pace and has been going on for, listen for this, over 15 years. I think it's emblematic that of a larger bureaucratic problems with FERC that you guys need to know about. Not only has Greenwood County spent a lot of time dealing with this, they have also spent a lot of money. FERC mandated they impanel a board of consultants. This is after they had their own engineers involved. That board of consultants cost Greenwood County $135,000. Further, there is no assurance on FERC's end that they will accept what the Board of Consultants' uh, proposal is. This means that Greenwood could be paying hundreds of thousands of dollars, taxpayer dollars, ultimately have their proposal rejected. There's got to be a better way to do this, guys. Chairman Glick, you noted in your testimony the importance of environmental justice in the context of decision-making. Look at this situation. FERC has made a small rural county in South Carolina go back and forth for 15 years at the total cost to the county of $2 million and countless hours and personnel. So I, I recognize you probably cannot speak to the specifics of this situation on the spot. I'll ask you to get back to me. But do you think it's reasonable for an emergency fuse plug project on a lake that's been around that long survived the 2015 floods um, 
Did it take more than 15 years to be designed? And also, do you believe it's appropriate for Greenwood County to have been forced by FERC to spend over $2 million and yet not have achieved full design and approval of the project? Thank you, Mr. Duncan. I, I can't, as you say, I can't comment on the specific project. I certainly can get back to you with some more specifics. I will say this, 15 years and the cost that you, that you uh, uh, outlined are definitely uh, not appropriate in my, my opinion. We have, a, we have a responsibility to protect the public interest. We have a lot of different responsibilities under the Federal Power Act and the Natural Gas Act, for instance. But one of the things we need to do a much better job on, in my opinion, is, is we need to be more efficient. We need to move things along more quickly. We need to make sure that uh, 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 various parties that participate in our proceedings don't have to incur you know, millions of dollars of legal bills to the extent we have some control over it. Sometimes these are very complicated issues. But you have my word that I'll work with you and try to expedite the process. Yeah, it's a fuse plug and uh, for, a, for a down. Um, thanks for your commitment to work with my staff to, and Greenwood County. I was hesitant to bring that up because sometimes you, you bring a project that up, the federal government, and it actually hurts a project more. But, you know, heck, 15 years and $2 million, I don't think you can hurt this county much more. It's time to get that deal done. I want to shift gears real quick and talk about the provision in the Clean Future Act that establishes a federal right to clean energy. This would allow large corporate energy purchasers to use their buying power to directly procure one source of generation, mainly intermittent renewables, at preferential rates. This would shift the cost of maintaining a 24-7 reliability to the remaining customers, the average residential customers. So you're shifting the cost given preferential treatment corporations. I don't see how that's environmental justice but or, or energy justice. But uh, I want to ask uh, Mr. Christie, what are your thoughts on this and how does this affect consumer protections built into state laws and rules to minimize the inequitable cost shifting and promote reliability? Uh well, Congressman, I'm not actually familiar with that particular provision of that legislation. Uh, our statute is that, that rates have to be just and reasonable and not preferential or uh, discriminatory. So on the surface, it would sound discriminatory. But again, I don't know that provision. And so I'd have to look at that. If that law passes, we would have to implement it. But right now, our statute is non-preferential and non-discriminatory. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm out of time, guys. I'll be over soon. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welch, for five minutes. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to uh, go follow up on, uh, on something that my colleague, Mr. Doyle, uh, asked. And uh, that is about just uh, distributed energy. And uh, I think he asked a question about what kind of benefits can our electricity grid derive. But I'd like to focus on, and I'll start with you, uh, Chairman Glick, what will you do and the commission do uh, to ensure that our market operators, such as ISO New England, are able to meet their compliance dates for the order? Are there things that FERC can be doing to better engage with the market operators to address the challenges that they're facing? We got the order done, but it's not implemented. Uh, Chairman Glick. Well, yes, as you mentioned, so we have uh, several process, several points in the process. The first point is is the issue of the rulemaking, which we did the final rule. The next stage is compliance, which again the, the various RTOs have submitted their compliance proposals to us. Sometimes we accept them, sometimes we reject them, sometimes we ask them to modify their proposals. So uh, we will make sure that and uh, ensure that all of the RTOs, including ISO New England complies with the requirements of the spirit and the requirements of the particular rule, in this particular case, the DER rule. And uh, to the extent they don't, we'll continue to, uh, we, we, have, we, have, we oversee the R R ISO New England. We have regulatory authority over all the various RTOs around the country, and we will make sure that they, that they do comply. Uh, Commissioner uh, Chatterjee, do you want to uh, add anything to that? Yeah, no, I want to echo what the chairman said and uh, just make the point that while, uh, the DER rule for quarter 2222 was, uh, I think, certainly uh, historic in nature. Um, the difference between it being a uh, positive step forward and a truly landmark uh, rulemaking that will uh, change the energy landscape will be played out in the compliance and implementation process. 
And I think it's really incumbent. You have a lot of new entrants to the energy space who aren't perhaps as familiar with dealing with FERC and dealing with the RTOs and the ISOs that need to be brought into the fold and participate in these stakeholder processes. Because uh, I think it is so important that um, the compliance filings that come to the commission be strong so that uh, this, uh, this rulemaking can truly have the historic impact that it has the potential to have. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. You know, I know FERC is also considering the best way to incorporate innovative technologies, uh, such as demand response, into com to competitive markets without violating um, state agency requirements. And obviously, demand response, uh, such as energy efficiency, behind the meter technology, smart building innovation, that's going to continue to grow in importance. And it's all very local, so it's got a significant economic uh, benefit. Uh, and throughout my time in Congress, I've worked with others for the deployment of smart meters, energy efficiency technology, and so on. Chairman Glick, how will FERC plan uh, so that we can ensure that new technologies are absolutely fully able to participate in energy markets? Because there's got to be a market for that activity to make it widely deployed while simultaneously protecting the ability of states to maintain authority over resources that operate uh, on the distribution side. So I appreciate the question, Mr. Welch. And in fact, on demand response, I agree with you. It's, demand response has provided a significant number of benefits in terms of especially on reliability and resilience. All you have to do is look at what happened last summer in California. Demand response was really the unsung hero in keeping the lights on for most of the time. Um, with, with regard to uh, technologies, and there, there's certainly a growing division between state regulation and federal regulation because a lot of the technologies that we're talking about now were primarily uh, subject to state oversight. They're now participating or, or seeking to participate in the wholesale markets. So we've been trying to work with the states on these various issues. And in fact, I'll give you an example with regard to demand, um, uh, demand uh, with regard to distributed energy resources. We've made it very clear that we are not going to uh, deal with the interconnection of those particular facilities to the grid. That's subject to state regulation. And we also made it clear that states have the ability to oversee um, the rules that, that are set out with regard to a distributed energy resource that participates both in the retail market and the wholesale market, which is subject to our jurisdiction. So we're trying to reach out to the states as much as we can, continuing to dialogue with them. It's obviously, there's some tension on some of the issues, but we have tried to limit our, our oversight just to the participation of those resources in the wholesale market and leave some of the issues behind, behind the meter issues to the states. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Palmer, for five minutes. Mr. Palmer, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the witnesses for their participation and their patience and and uh, sticking in here with us. Um, I want to ask you, uh, Mr. Glick, about uh, inflation. Are you concerned about inflation? I think everyone is, yes. Uh, then if you're concerned about inflation, then you're also, you have to be concerned about our, our uh, this administration's energy policies because energy is perhaps the most inflationary part of, of, of our economy, the most inflationary commodity and in, in, in the consumer price index because it impacts everything. So are you concerned about that? I'm absolutely concerned about high energy prices, yes. Yeah. Well, this, uh, this mass uh, exit from, from the use of natural gas and fossil fuels that, that my colleagues uh, advocate uh, toward a, a, a complete renewable power grid is going to necessarily increase energy costs across the board. Uh, I, I don't know how many engineers you have at, uh, at uh, FERC. I, we looked at the top 100 uh, salaries and they're 60 of them were economists, and I'm fine with economists. I used to joke God made economists to make actuaries look interesting, but you do need some engineers uh, to, to look at these because it's going to have a huge impact on families. And I'm particularly concerned about the lower income families. Uh, I've, I've brought this point up many times uh, in this committee and, and on the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis about Pembroke Township in Illinois, 2,100 people, 80, plus percent are African-American, they don't have a natural gas pipeline. Uh, they're activists such as uh, the Reverend Jesse Jackson trying to get a pipeline in there, yet I can't find uh, uh, 
colleagues on the other side of the aisle are willing to support that. Does it make sense to, to continue to deprive people of, of energy justice, if you want to use the word justice, uh, in pursuit of renewables? Thanks, Mr. Palmer. First of all, uh, as I understand, we only only four percent of our employees are actually economists. So I, I don't know uh, the statistic you looked at, but I, we can get back to you on, on that. Well, you have a lot more employees than the one hundred, but that's just yes. yeah. the top one hundred salaries. Yeah, I, I know. All I know is I'm not in one of the top one hundred salaries. So. <laughs> um, with regard to I, I, it's our our job, our job again is to protect the public interest, and our statutory responsibility is to ensure that energy rates, whether it be through pipeline rates or wholesale electric rates, are just and reasonable. And, uh, and and that's that's the goal that's the goal with, with which we regulate. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. Did well, you? well I, I don't want to get off on, on that too far because we've established the fact that inflation is a problem and energy is a big part of the inflationary equation. But I also want to point out something else about the fact that uh, there was a, re a report came out uh, a few years ago that we were within five percent of the Chinese in manufacturing costs, and it was really because of the fracking revolution. Natural gas prices had dropped precipitously, and and uh, but we also are, are have higher productivity. There's an issue here that I think we, we don't really take into consideration, and it's of great concern to me. Um, moving to 100% renewables, I think we need to look at this in the context of national security because I, I, anyone who knows anything about China knows they have zero intent of moving away from fossil fuels, whether it's coal, oil, or natural gas. And it's putting us in this pursuit of, of net zero. Even John Kerry admits that if the United States achieved its net zero goal, and, and we've had leading scientists admit that if we went to absolute zero, it won't stop climate change and, it, and, and particularly won't impact it because China's not going to participate. Shouldn't that be part of your considerations uh, when we're, we're looking at these, these changes and going to RTOs? Uh, Mr. Chairman, you're not muted. Reclaim, uh, suspending my time, Mr. Chairman, I think you're not m muted. Re uh, reclaiming my time. Uh, you can proceed unmuted. So go ahead. So, Mr. Palmer, I'm I'm, I'm not. I don't think I, I can. I'm expert enough to comment on on the China comment, but I will say this. Um, if you look at over the last 10 years, uh, wholesale electricity prices have gone down pretty significantly. In large part, you mentioned gas. Natural gas is certainly a big part of that. But also the, the competitiveness of the zero emissions, zero marginal cost technologies, such as wind and solar, have brought down costs as well. But that's only because we have heavily subsidized those. And, and ultimately, the taxpayer pays for that. It may not show up on their utility bill, but they're paying for it. All, a lot of technologies have been subsidized, so it's fracking, as you mentioned, as well. But to the extent after those technologies, after the development of those technologies are subsidized, those subsidies do go away, and then those, those, those technologies are cost competitive. So I do believe that we can move forward in the clean energy future and do so in a way that's consistent with um, a lower cost energy. I hear the tapping. That means my time has expired. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes... The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Beasley, for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you uh, very much. Uh, and thank you, Chairman Glick and all of the FERC commissioners for uh, joining us today. Uh, FERC obviously plays a key role in organizing energy markets and has a very important job in ensuring competitive and reliable energy for, uh, for Americans. Uh, obviously, everybody remembers the recent events in my home state of Texas where we had uh, unprecedented uh, weather occurrence that happened there. Uh, a few months after uh, a devastating, after the devastating storm, which left over 700 Texans dead, I think a lot of people forget that. Uh, people are obviously uh, uh, were wondering why they were asked to conserve energy here recently, uh, uh, when we had uh, some issues with the grid uh, during at the very beginning of our uh, blistering summer heat. Uh, there are obviously a lot of benefits to um, to to ERCOT being independent. Uh, and obviously, yeah, there's an, a, a completely other side to that issue as well. Uh, uh, but uh, I wrote a letter to FERC in February, uh, and I asked, uh, I asked uh, and, and letting them know that I support uh, and join inquiry by FERC and NERC to investigate the operations of the bulk power system during the storm. And I think uh, there is a need to have a real conversation about the benefits and challenges of greater interconnections between ERCOT and the rest of the country. 
Uh, there are certainly a certain number of uh, legal and technical uh, challenges, some infrastructure hurdles that will need to be overcome uh, before we do that. But there was a recent report by the American Council on Renewable Energy, uh, and they found that uh, each additional gigawatt of transmission capacity connecting the Texas power grid with neighboring states in the southeast could save nearly uh, $1 billion uh, and kept the heat on for approximately uh, 200,000 Texans uh, during that storm that we just had. Uh, the report uh, also found that additional transmission ties would have generated significant cost savings for consumers and reduced outages during extreme weather events uh, by canceling out uh, local fluctuations in the supply and demand of electricity and providing alternative sources of power in an emergency. Uh, and my question today is for Commissioner uh, Clement. Uh, in your testimony, you mentioned the overload interconnection queues and costly project delays caused by a lack of transmission uh, and state the need to build out cost-effective high-voltage transmission across the country. Uh, you went on to contrast the experiences in ERCOT uh, with those of neighboring regional transmission organizations such as Southwest Power Pool uh, and the uh, Mid-Continent uh, independent system operator, both of which were able to import uh, power from their neighbors. Uh, Commissioner Clements, can you expand on how greater transmission in Texas might uh, have uh, saved us from uh, all freezing? Sure, thank you for the question, Representative, and I appreciate the, the tragic circumstances that, that uh, citizens in your state, including some of my family members, experienced. The, Commission has reliability jurisdiction over the whole country. So one road to ensuring uh, safety is, is via our reliability authority. When it comes to high voltage transmission, um, as I mentioned earlier, it, the mid-Atlantic region in these cold weather events in February was able to share with the Midwest region, which was able to share with the Great Plains, but because of the lack of interconnection to Texas, there was not a power sharing that could have helped prevent the outages that took place. I think FERC will succeed in its regulatory goals of protecting customers and reliability if it finds the balance of respecting regional differences to allow Texas to be Texas, to allow the West to be the West, but finds that piece of interconnection and integration and facilitates that in a cost-effective way that is both in the national interest but also in individual states' interests and can't be accomplished simply within the state boundaries. Yeah, no, absolutely. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, also, I mean, I guess the, the flip side to that, that I guess that people don't talk about a lot, and obviously because we were in the cold, we need to address the fact that we didn't have power. But, uh, you know, most people know that Texas, that we actually produce more wind than anyone else in the country, that we produce more wind than uh, the, the European Union does, percentage-wise. Um, do you think that there are benefits such as the ability to export power during times of surplus when wind power might otherwise be curtailed? Absolutely. Uh, that's a proven uh, benefit of regional grid interconnection across the country. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the general lady from Arizona, Ms. Lesko, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to submit to the record the Wall Street Journal editorial dated July 11th. 2021 titled California's Power Jam and the statement of Arizona Corporation Commission Chairwoman Leah Marquez Peterson dated June 30th, 2021 in response to FERC's June 25th order allowing um, CAISO, which is the California Independent System Operator, to prioritize electric utilities in California at the expense of utilities in Arizona and other states. Uh, I would ask the general lady if she would defer until uh, the conclusion of the hearing so I that the staff could uh, have a chance to, uh, to uh, look at the, the documents and that you are requesting. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to read a portion of the Arizona Utility Regulator Chairwoman's uh, statement. She says... As a result of short-sighted energy policies, poor long-term planning, and extensive rolling blackouts in 2020, CAISO petitioned FERC to make changes to its tariff related to transmission priority through California. For years, 
Arizona's, Arizonans have relied upon clean and reliable energy purchased from hydropower dams in Oregon, flowing through power lines in California to cool our homes during the hot summer months. Despite overwhelming opposition from other states in the West, FERC sided with California and granted the change which will allow California to stop energy from flowing to Arizona, which could mean power shortages for Arizonans. Mr. Glick, Commissioner Glick, how is the Commission's order consistent with its well-established and long-standing requirement that transmission providers treat third parties in a manner comparable to how they treat themselves? And does the commission believe that California load is more important than load out the, outside the state, meaning Arizona's? Thank you very much for the question, Ms. Lesko. Um, actually, I, last week, I actually met with the uh, chair of the Arizona Utility Commission, and although this is an ongoing proceeding, so we didn't talk about this particular proceeding, but she expressed some, some concerns about what's going on in California, and we agreed that we were going to continue our discussions. Um, Congress, in, in, in the 2005 Energy Policy Act, essentially laid out an approach that, that we are supposed to um, uh, enable uh, or allow utilities to, to serve native load customers first. And pursuant to that, we issue, uh, in, in our Order 890, we actually gave the authority or authorized the authority for utilities to essentially benefit native load customers over others. And that's the statutory authority pursuant which we acted in approving the California order. Now, that order is pending on rehearing, uh, but uh, uh, that, was our, that was the reasoning that the commission um, used in, in our particular order. Thank you, Chairman Glick. And Commissioner Christie, explain to me your rationale for discriminating against non-California states that are paying in advance for a service and being denied that product per contractual obligations. Well, again, if you're referring to that case, that, I am. Okay, that's still pending in front of us. But I'll say it was the law in effect at the, that applied to that case, and the facts of that case led to the result. I think it illustrates a bigger issue. I would say, uh, Congressman Lesko, is states in the West, before they make a decision to enter an RTO, had better look long and hard at the pros and cons of what they're getting into. I've been in a state that's been in an RTO for the last 17 years. There are advantages and there are disadvantages. And the Western states, before joining an RTO or forming an RTO, should thoroughly evaluate the advantages and disadvantages. And also, on, gener on, on resource adequacy for Arizona or any other state, FERC doesn't order, cannot order a single state to build a generating unit, and FERC cannot order a single state to, to shut down a generating unit. Those resource adequacy decisions are largely at the state level, and I think they should stay there. But it goes to the questions that states have to look at when they decide about their own generation mix and whether to join an RTO. Thank you, sir. Um, I just want to say to all the commissioners, I urge FERC to grant the request for a rehearing and reverse your order. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman lady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Schrader. For five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank the panel for coming. Uh, we're trying to serve many masters here, as I'm sure you've heard from others, running in and out of different hearings. So I apologize for not being here for the entirety. Uh, follow up a little bit on Rep. Lesko's comments. You know, I come from Oregon. Uh, we're a northern neighbor to California, and obviously have some of the similar concerns. I guess I may frame things just uh, slightly different. Uh, FERC recently announced it would review the rules uh, for its transmission planning and cost allocation. I think that's a great idea. Uh, however, as you know, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, with the public utilities that we have, uh, or excuse me, with the government-owned utilities, i.e. BPA, that we consider ourselves not necessarily subject to FERC and wanted some confirmation that uh, uh, we would not be forced into participating uh, into the, some of the... Uh, uh, existing organized markets that Mr. Christie and others referred to uh, with the process that you're undergoing. I guess I'd ask uh, uh, Honorable Ms. Clements uh, if that is indeed your intent. 
Sure. Um, the I think the reciprocity principle that is available to non-jurisdictional entities like BPA offers is is compelling in the sense that there are benefits to be gained by uh, co regional and interregional coordination and cooperation. But certainly, to the extent that those entities are not interested in participating, we we follow our jurisdiction uh, rules relative to to their participation. So they would not be forced by FERC to do that. Correct. Very good. Very good. Um, with uh, the CASO uh, uh, decisions that are going on at this point in time, uh, uh, concerned a little bit about the same thing, about discrimination in favor of CASO, should Oregon, uh, BPA in particular, try and get engaged in the marketplace there, that uh, that sort of effort could undermine, could be, uh, it could be discrimination against uh, other uh, governmental owned power sources or utilities and wanted to make sure that uh, they would not be, you know, CASA would not have undue leverage, if you will, to undermine the marketplace in, in my state. Sure, Representative. Um, the, there's the question of how do we get through this summer um, that the, the issues that were being discussed, uh, that case that we can't talk about is covering. And then there's the issue of what do we do? These, these changes are coming at us quickly. The, the, extent, the length of, of fire, forest fire season is, is getting longer. The, you know, the hydro reserves are, are get growing uh, lower each, each summer. And so the question is how do we do regional planning in a way that respects the rights of states and stakeholders across the West, but it's in coordinated in such a fashion that we are equipped as a region, that you all are equipped as a region to effectively move forward. That's a good answer. You could run for my office with that answer. That's very good. Uh, not No disrespect. Um, we're just very sensitive when we did deregulation back in the day and Exxon was gonna be a wonderful thing for my great state. Uh, didn't work out so well. So we're very, like Arizona and many other states in the region, that are not California, uh, with all due respect to that great state, uh, very concerned about how that would uh, play out. The last question is that, uh, as alluded to in the hearing, trans citing transmission lines is difficult. And 52% uh, of my state is owned by the federal government. So I'm just curious uh, if there's any uh, initiative or any particular criteria or process by which you're going to smooth the way for uh, citing of transmission lines across uh, federal lands in my great state and the rest of the country. Ms. Clements again, I'm sorry. Sure, no problem. I absolutely, sir. The, the advanced notice of proposed rulemaking about transmission reform and interconnection reform asks a broad set of questions around how to best take our regional planning processes forward in a way that does um, both respect, you know, state's jurisdiction over resource adequacy and preference, policy preferences, as well as the need for uh, increased coordination in the interest of protecting customers and reliability. So it's still open to quite a bit of input at this point in time. That's right. And we look forward to reviewing the record, and I look forward to working with my colleagues towards taking action from that record. Yeah, very good. With that, I uh, yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Pence, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Rush and Ranking Member Upton for holding this hearing, and thank you to the commissioners for being here today. This committee is keenly aware of the ongoing energy transition as U.S. companies seek to develop new sources of generation to meet energy needs. The role of your commission in this committee is to ensure that any potential transition does not negatively affect reliability or affordability. As a proponent of uh, the all of the above and all of the below, energy strategy, I'm encouraged by the developments in battery storage, advanced nuclear, and alternative liquid fuels. However, I'm concerned that some of my colleagues and potential FERC actions might move too quickly and outpace the current state of technologies. Discussions about putting a tax on carbon could artificially price out fossil fuels, which pro provide affordable home energy prices and reliable base load electricity. For Hoosiers, that results in increased prices to heat our homes and cook our meals unless we switch to the electrical options. Earlier this year, I had the opportunity to sit down with the Mid-Continent Independent System Operator, or MISO, who oversees grid reliability across the Midwest, including almost all of Indiana. They estimate that by 2030, a potential energy mix in the region that does not impact reliability 
could be 32% renewables and 55% fossil fuels. This is far from the emission reduction goals supported by the administration, my colleagues, and I've said many times, I'm, I'm concerned we're, we're setting ourselves up to accidentally fail. Pricing out natural gas with regulations and carbon taxes will have even further reaching consequences across the Indiana economy. Consider South, Southeastern Indiana Natural Gas located in Milan, Indiana, a local distribution company that provides natural gas to residential, agriculture, and commercial customers. Since Indiana is geographically isolated from natural gas production, interstate pipelines connect with Southeastern to provide a valuable economic driver to the surrounding communities. Hoosier manufacturing and agriculture industries benefit from access to interstate pipelines from neighboring gas producing states like Ohio and Pennsylvania. Several states and regional transmission organizations have already introduced different variations of carbon pricing regulations in electricity markets. In a recent FERC policy statement, the commission outlined considerations for entity, entities that choose to enter into carbon price regime, regimes. This regulatory burden on fossil fuels could raise prices for a company like Southeastern until they have no choice but to pass those costs onto their com customers, both commercial and residential. Meanwhile, pipelines remain the safest, most reliable, and environmentally friendly way to move fuels. I personally shipped through pipelines, rail, trucking companies in my previous life. Nothing is safer than pipelines. I urge my colleagues to consider the broad implications before rapidly foregoing a 125-year-old industry of energy delivery and consumption. Chairman Glick. Has your commission built pro forma impacts on the, on the affordability for consumers as the, the environmental, uh, the regulatory environment makes a transition away from current base load generation from fossil fuels? Have, have you built, uh, have you looked at what the different impacts may be? No, we, we uh, basically consider those issues on a case-by-case -case basis when a matter comes before us as to whether a particular wholesale rate is just and reasonable or not. I just want to point out we are technology neutral, so we don't choose one technology or another, or nor do we actually establish uh, carbon pricing. Th those are for the states and for others. We just, our policy statement dealt with facilitating carbon pricing, but we certainly, I don't believe we have the legal authority to impose carbon pricing on our own. Well, I hope we don't get there too. So, all right, I thank you and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the general lady from New Hampshire, Ms. Custer, for five minutes. Ms. Custer, you are recognized for five minutes. The chair now recognizes the general lady from California, Ms. Marigan, for five minutes. Ms. Marigan, you are recognized for five minutes. The chair now recognizes uh, Ms. Blunt Rochester for five minutes. Uh, Ms. Blunt Rochester, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Upton for calling this important hearing. I also want to thank Chairman Glick and all of the commissioners for their testimonies today. Earlier this year, the Biden administration issued Executive Order 14008, which requires agencies to prioritize environmental justice and address the adverse safety and health effects of actions on low wealth communities and communities of color. Chairman Glick, what is FERC's current process for identifying and assessing the effects of its actions on low wealth communities and communities of color? And what additional actions can the commission take, particularly in the siting of natural gas pipelines and compressor stations to better protect these communities? Thank you very much, Ms. Rochester. I, I, when I first came to the commission and we were dealing with these gas pipeline siting cases, I started reading some of the environmental impact statements that we prepare in advance of our, our vote. And it became clear to me that we weren't spending a significant amount of time on environmental justice. Each environmental impact statement has a section on it, but we were, we were I think we were, in my opinion, we were giving it mostly lip service. And it became clear to me that this is, this is an important issue. A lot of these uh, facilities, whether it be compressor stations or pipelines or LNG facilities, are, are essentially cited in areas where there's uh, environmental justice communities. 
So upon uh, becoming chair in January, I appointed uh, uh, Montina Cole, who is our new senior counsel for environmental justice and, and equity. And in particular, her responsibilities will be to work a, on a, from a cross-cutting basis across the agency to make sure not only are decisions with regard to pipelines take into account impacts on, on uh, environmental justice communities, but all of our decisions, uh, because it's very important they have an impact, all of our decisions have an impact on these communities, and it's very clear from, from, from you know, what, what we've just been discussing today that in many of these issues, why they're important to folks, a lot of people don't have necessarily the resources to follow FERC on a day-by-day -day basis. We're a very complicated uh, agency in some respects. So we're gonna reach out to our Office of Public Participation to these communities, but also make sure that in our decision-making process, we take these concerns into account up front. Great, thank you. And weather-related power outages cost Americans billions of dollars every year. We know that interregional transmission can increase the reliability of our power grid and can help prevent outages that are both costly and deadly. Uh, my colleague, Rep. Peters, mentioned the study from the American Council on Renewable Energy that highlighted the benefits and cost savings of connecting the Texas power grid to uh, southeastern United States. These benefits from transmission exist across the country, including in my state of Delaware. Given the reliability benefits of interregional transmission, can you discuss whether FERC should direct the North American Electric Reliability uh, Corporation to adopt a reliability standard or standards requiring greater interregional transfer capacity? Well, uh, thank you for that question. We, we are in the, uh, just towards the end of a uh, joint inquiry with, with NERC, uh, looking at uh, the causes of what occurred last winter with regard to uh, winter storm URI, and especially the impact on Texas. And I'm gonna wait, await the recommendations, but I expect the recommendations will include at least some sort of look at or consideration of interregional transmission. Now there are jurisdictional issues uh, in terms of uh, 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 connecting, the rest of the, connecting the Texas grid to the rest of the country. But I believe, um, uh, at least with regard to NERC and FERC, we should very, very much at least consider those issues as they impact the reliability of the electric grid, most, most importantly, the bulk power system. Thank you. And, and Commissioner uh, Clements, pipelines have historically been built in low wealth communities and communities of color with limited resources. Often individuals, landowners, and members of these communities are unaware of how to advocate for themselves or intervene in FERC proceedings. And uh, the chairman mentioned this as well. Um, as you know, Congress first directed FERC to establish an Office of Participation in 1978. And more than 40 years passed um, before the Office of Public Participation was established. During this time, FERC proceedings were uh, inaccessible to many members of, of these communities and in addition to individuals with disabilities. Um, I want to first applaud the commission for finally taking the step to establish the Office of Public Participation. However, we all know it's not enough to just establish an office. It's essential that stakeholders, stakeholders have the tools and the ability to actually um, have that funding to meaningfully participate. Um, can you, as just as a follow-up, what tools do you think are necessary to help public the public meaningfully participate? And um, do you agree that intervener funding is critical for realizing that success? And Thank you for the question. I see we're low on time and I'd be happy to follow up, but I appreciate your recognition of the issue. And I also recognize the importance of potential in intervener funding. The statute requires the commission to uh, proceed with the rulemaking process to con consider whether and how that would take place. And, and I'm looking forward to ensuring that that takes place. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, for the extra time, and we'll follow up in, in writing, and I yield back. John Lane, back. The chair announces that there is a vote that is uh, occurring on the floor, uh, and that uh, it is the chairman's uh, desire now that the committee will be in recess uh, pending the uh, call of the chair time uh, 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 undetermined right now. So the, the chair uh, will call the committee to recess um, until for an indefinite amount of time until uh, the vote either concludes, vote on the floor concludes, uh, and there are members who are present uh, in the mail phone or in the committee room. Uh, the committee now stands in recess.
will now reconvene. And I uh, want to thank members for returning uh, to uh, this hearing. And the chair now recognizes um, the general lady from New Hampshire, Ms. Custer, for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you reconvening and giving us the opportunity. In Reno, Nevada, airlines and airports are beginning to face jet fuel shortages. With air travel down last year during the height of the pandemic, demand for jet fuel plummeted, reducing the share of this fuel in America's pipelines. Now that travel is increasing, airlines are short on fuel, impacting passenger flights and critical cargo. Chairman Glick, do you anticipate more widespread jet fuel shortages? Are current shortages impacting the delivery of medicines? And do you commit to working with governors, airlines, and pipelines to address this problem in a timely manner? Thank you for the question, Ms. Custer. Um, this is a matter of definite concern to us. So uh, the way it works, if, if for, for, we regulate oil pipelines as well as natural gas pipelines. With regard to oil pipelines, if there's more demand than there is supply or capacity on that particular pipeline, it's, uh, pr the, uh, the supply is pro-rationed out to um, uh, competing users of the, of the pipeline, depending on their historic use. And as you know, because of the pandemic, there, uh, the, the uh, jet fuel uh, use was way down last year. And so we got into a situation with regard to the Reno airport, as you mentioned, where we got a call on Friday about this. In, in the sense that the, the, uh, the, the, the demand for jet fuel is far greater than the supply based on the pro ration share that the, jet, uh, uh, the, the, the airlines are able to get. So um, there are uh, various options. We are looking at this. Uh, there was a filing made yesterday. I, I, it's, a, it's an ongoing proceeding, so I'm not allowed to talk about it, but essentially there was a request for, for the commission to use its emergency, the emergency authority to reallocate some of the uh, capacity on the line, and we're, we're taking a look at that. Um, but there are other options that the airlines are looking for, looking to as well, including working uh, to trucking in fuel from other parts. For instance, in the Bay Area, there's plenty of supply. Trying to get the fuel into into Reno, Nevada, for instance, is um, is, is of some some is a lot of interest there. But the problem is there isn't enough trucking capacity there, including truck drivers. So we're working with industry. We're working. We had a, a good meeting on the other day with the uh, airline industry, and uh, but but it is a matter that is of concern in Reno now but it could spread to other airports. So we are monitoring this very closely and trying to work with the airline industry and other uh, interested stakeholders to try to figure out a, a solution going forward. Great, well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. I'm gonna turn my attention to hydropower. Hydropower makes up more than 6% of electric generation nationwide and is the United States second largest source of renewable energy. My bipartisan bill, the 21st Century Dams Act, lays out a bold plan to retrofit, rehabilitate, and remove dams to not only increase clean energy production through retrofitting dams for hydropower production, but improve dam safety by rehabilitating dams. And when dam owners and communities agree it's the best path forward, actually removing dams to return river ecosystems to their natural state. This bill will help us reduce carbon emissions, create a more resilient energy system, support more than 450,000 American jobs, and improve the health of our nation's rivers. Chairman Glick, can investments in hydropower aid our nation national efforts to move toward a distributed clean energy grid? Well, I think hydropower is a very important role to play as we move towards a clean energy future. Obviously, it's a zero emissions technology. It also plays an important role in integrating uh, intermittent resources, helping to inter integrate intermittent resources most cost effectively and efficiently. Um, and uh, I think I, I understand your bill has several components to it. I would say with regard to um, a powering uh, re or repowering or powering non-power dams, I think there's significant potential that the Department of Energy identified substantial additional capacity that could be added by uh, adding hydropower to non-power dams and uh, something we are taking a look at. We actually have a, a program underway as a result of legislation that passed in 2018. I would also say that there are times when uh, the, the, the licensee or the owner or the operator of a particular uh, hydro facility finds that it's more expensive to continue operating it, especially with regard to a certain environmental conditions. And so they have come to the commission and seeking the uh, permission to actually dismantle or, or um, 
uh, eliminate the, the, the dam in order to, uh, to improve environmental conditions in the area. And so we, we actually have a process for that too. We work with each individual licensee on a case-by-case -case basis. Great, thank you. And we'll look forward to working with you on that. So switching gears just a bit, I only have a few seconds left. I wanna discuss the minimum price offer rule. MOPR artificially inflates the cost of clean energy resources. I just wanted to uh, jump ahead here. You've opposed the MOPR and called on grid operators to reform or eliminate the rule. Um, could you comment briefly? My time is up, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you, Ms. Custer, and I'll speak very quickly about it. Uh, yes, I've, I've been very opposed to the minimum offer price rule that's been established in the Eastern RTO capacity markets, in large part because I think it, it's contrary to what the Federal Power Act tells us, which is the states and not FERC have the authority over resource decision-making, and MOPRs in, essentially cause um, uh, state-supported resources to be at a competitive disadvantage. So uh, I, I understand that uh, the various RTOs, New England, PJM, and New York are actually looking at modifications to their program, and uh, hopefully they'll be following them soon and we'll be considering them uh, as expeditiously as possible. Thank you so much for your comments. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The, the gentleman that yields back, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Joyce, for five minutes. Mr. Joyce, you're recognized for five minutes. The chair now recognizes Mr. Joyce. The chair recognizes Mr. Long. Mr. Armstrong. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Ms. the young lady from Texas, Ms. Fletcher, for five minutes. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to participate in today's hearing, and thank you to all of our witnesses. I have appreciated hearing your, your thoughts and insights tonight, uh, or today in this, uh, in this hearing, and um, wanted to follow up with you on a few things. I do represent the 7th Congressional District in Houston, and certainly um, am, am very keenly following a lot of the developments and things um, happening, and appreciate the chance to ask you a few questions. Um, so I'll get right to it and, and I'll start um, with Chairman Glick. Um, you know, it's important uh, for, for my constituents and for people uh, across the country to know that the Commission's rate making policies properly compensate and incentivize emissions reduction investments in our natural gas infrastructure, such as replacing older machinery with new or low zero uh, emissions technology, installing carbon capture equipment, that's certainly a, a topic. Um, at home, upgrading pipelines to blend in hydrogen and renewable natural gas. These are all things that we're doing to address the impacts of climate change. And one of our goals is, of course, to bring down emissions as quickly as possible. So um, we really shouldn't require natural gas infrastructure companies to go through a multi-year FERC proceeding that reevaluates all aspects of their rate simply to recover basic modernization and emissions investments. Does FERC have or is FERC considering an efficient mechanism for encouraging natural gas pipeline emissions reduction investments? And I'll start with you, Chairman Glick, and if anyone else wants to weigh in, I would appreciate that. Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, I think our, with regard to our particular uh, authority with regard to natural gas pipelines and rate making, we have the authority to um, uh, approve any prudently incurred investment that the company makes. But we have to take that on a case-by-case -case basis, so clearly, if a uh, pipeline company came in and said they had emissions reductions equipment, to the extent it was a prudent investment, we would allow recovery of that. Okay, and I mean, do you do you agree with me that it's important to continue investing in our country's natural gas infrastructure to achieve America's energy and climate goals? I think I think there are certain cases where absolutely that we need additional pipeline investment. I'll give you an example. New England's a good era, a good, good example where. They need additional natural gas pipeline um, uh, infrastructure or capacity in order to meet uh, certain demands during, during the winter, for instance. Um, I would say with regard to, uh, go, going back to your, your, your previous question, when we review or when we examine or, or certificate a particular proposed pipeline, uh, if there are uh, actions that the company takes 
to reduce emissions, for instance, or, or, or make their pipeline more efficient, um, we certainly encourage that because we essentially require, we, we, we could require mitigation of any adverse environmental impact. So there are ways of company, companies can make these investments that would promote development and promote their, uh, their ability to, be, to get a certificate and move forward with the pipeline project. Um, okay, well, thank you for that. And I think uh, in answering my last question, you also touched on uh, the role that you think natural gas infrastructure can play in, in, um, in our energy future. And certainly uh, right now it has and will continue in the future to help ensure reliability as more renewables are deployed on the power grid as well. Um, with the time I have left, I want to uh, touch on one very specific item um, because I think that this investment in infrastructure is really important. Um, and we, we all know that the building infrastructure project has taken longer and longer in recent years. How much do you, uh, how much delay do you expect FERC's recent order 871 to add to pipeline development timeline, considering that most of these projects already take many years to design, permit and build? I don't think Order 871 will provide much delay at all. Essentially, what that order requires, it, it basically says, when you get a certificate, uh, if you if there are parties that have expressed or filed for rehearing of our particular decision, uh, we require that that, that that basically up until um, the party filing for rehearing would have the ability to have their 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 request decided by the commission before the, the, the company can move forward and utilize eminent domain. But in that particular order, we we put a 90-day time limit. So whatever happens first, either the commission issues a rehearing order, which hopefully happens a lot sooner than 90 days, or if 90 days expires, then the pipeline can then move forward and go to court and seek eminent domain authority. Um, well, well, thank you for clarifying that. I think there is, um, there is a lack of clarity um, about what uh, folks need to do in response to Order 871. So I appreciate your insight that it shouldn't cause delay and would love to continue that conversation. Um, but as I am uh, running out of time, I will thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for allowing me to participate, and I will yield back. The gentleman lady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Joyce, for five minutes. First, I want to thank you, Chairman Rush, for allowing me to wave on to this subcommittee hearing and thank all of the commissioners for appearing here with us today. In the past decade, American energy needs have continued to grow. Manufacturing in the United States uses over 30% of the nation's power. Electric car sales are climbing with a 17% growth from 2016 to 2020. And with them, they're increasing drain on our grid. Likewise, every American continues to depend on our grid to heat and cool their homes and enjoy the standards of living that we are accustomed to in this country. It is essential that our energy grid remains as reliable and as dependable as possible. Regulatory agencies like FERC play a key role in this effort. As I discussed with Commissioner Wright of the NRC last week, maintaining a stable regulatory environment, a consistent strike zone, so to speak, is critical so business can invest with confidence on how to better serve America's energy needs. My first question is for you, Chairman Glick. As the lead agency, what is FERC doing to streamline pipeline permitting and to bring more certainty and predictability into this process? Thank you for the question, Mr. Joyce. Um, I had spent about 10 or 15 years, 10 to 15 years in the private sector uh, on, on several occasions. And uh, the one thing, and it was all for energy companies, the one thing I learned, the most important thing that the government can do is provide regulatory certainty. It's hard to make investment decisions, especially you're talking about billion dollar investment decisions, if you don't know where the government is going in terms of uh, regulation, whether that be FERC or Congress or the NRC or any other agency. And um, so that's, it's vitally important that we provide that level of certainty. I think with regard to, to the pipeline situation, I would say what we're trying to do is reduce the amount of litigation that occurs afterwards. Um, we've seen now on a couple of occasions, where the, uh, the, whether it be the MVP pipeline, the Atlantic Coast pipeline, or more recently the Spire pipeline in Illinois and Missouri, where the courts have essentially found that the agency uh, decisions that were made several years ago were not um, sufficient, that we didn't essentially cross our T's and dot our I's and do the analysis that were required. All those cases got sent back. In one case, the pipeline got um, 
it was terminated because it was too, too expensive and too, time, uh, too time-consuming to redo. And there's another one that's been pending for several additional years because of the court decision. There's a third one that's now pending before the commission again. All it does is add billions of dollars of litigation. It adds billions of dollars of additional administrative expense and takes uh, several additional years. So we're trying to provide a certainty up front so that when uh, pipeline companies come to the commission, we do the right thing and they don't have to come back the second time. Chairman Glick, will you commit to working with Congress to make these aforementioned improvements? Absolutely. Chairman Glick, how do you view natural gas power plants? Are they essential to back up weather-dependent renewables? So uh, as you, as you noted, noted, we are going to be experiencing a significant increase in generation of intermittent generation, whether it be wind or solar in particular. And because of that, we're going to need more flexible resources to deal with that intermittency. And that flexible resources, the flexible resources could be natural gas plants, flexible natural gas plants. It could be storage. It could be hydro in some cases. So I think we're going to need all of those technologies in order to be able to, to deal with the variability that's going to increase on the grid. Commissioner Chatterjee, coming from Pennsylvania, where there is an abundant supply of natural gas under the feet and under the homes of my constituents, would you comment on the role of natural gas as a backup energy source to renewables? Yeah, look, natural gas is uh, currently at the backbone of our energy transition. We are in the midst of this transition and it's been remarkable for consumers, for the economy and for the environment, but we could not have made this transition to this accelerated deployment of renewables without the, the flexible backup that is natural gas. So natural gas and the natural gas revolution have fundamentally changed the energy dynamic in this country and um, it's uh, been an amazing development and it's scary to think where we would be without natural gas. I agree. I think that the natural gas industry has supplied so much to our grid and will continue to do so. Commissioner Danley, could anti-pipeline policies have a negative impact on grid reliability? Um, thank you for the question. Of course, of course it can. We saw, um, sadly, in recent history, what happens to the reliability of the electric system when natural gas supplies are cut short. Um, during the storm in Texas this winter, in part, the failure of the grid to maintain system reliability and stability was due to the failure of natural gas to get to natural gas generators. My time has closed. Thank you, Chairman Rush, for allowing me to wave on to this important hearing, and I yield back. Mr. Chairman, I think you're on mute. I, I was on mute, and the chair now recognizes the regular, a regular a member of the uh, full committee and subcommittee, uh, Ms. Maringon from California. Ms. Maringon, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for calling this important oversight hearing on the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. As the Biden administration and Congress work to hold polluters accountable and invest in environmental justice and economically disadvantaged communities, it's critical the commission avoid doing harm by permitting more fossil fuel infrastructure in these communities. Chairman Glick, I appreciate your push to reform the commission's certificate policy, uh, the approval process to ensure you are giving serious consideration of climate and environmental justice impacts before approving gas pipeline projects. How should the commission factor climate impacts into the overall evaluation of a project? And what is the threshold at which a project's climate impact is too great to move forward? Thank you for the question, Congresswoman. Um, our, re our statutory requirement is that we find a proposed pipeline both is needed and it's in the public interest before we uh, permit the project to move forward. And uh, with regard to the public interest examination, essentially what we do is we consider the benefits of the project against its adverse impacts. And uh, the courts have told us on several occasions now that among the adverse impacts, uh, potential adverse impacts that we need to consider is the potential uh, greenhouse gas emissions associated with the proposed natural gas pipeline. And in particular, that, that the impact of those emissions on climate change. So in fact, we, we do uh, measure or we, do, we will weigh 
uh, the impact of those greenhouse gas emissions when doing our certificate analysis. Um, I, I can't tell you at this point exactly um, what level of emissions is too much, but I, as I said uh, in answer to a previous question, it's, it's, it's not just uh, the, the emissions level, it's actually whether you can mitigate those emissions. Uh, there are a whole bunch of other potential adverse impacts, whether it be to species, to wetlands, to air emissions, to a whole, whole bunch of other uh, impacts associated with the pipeline that the commission, when we consider a certificate proposal, tries to mitigate. And very, we very well could try to mitigate or require the, uh, the, the, the pipeline developer to mitigate their greenhouse gas emissions before we make a final decision on a pipeline. So we have to address these issues on a case-by-case -case basis. So is the, uh, are you taking a look at any cumulative impacts? Like what else is going on? Or are you looking only at a specific project and that specific project? So in, under our NEPA analysis, we do consider cumulative impacts, which is required or had been required under the uh, CEQ regulations, and we'll, we can continue to consider cumulative impacts. Um, uh, that also includes greenhouse gas emissions impacts. I would say that the commission up until recently actually had denied uh, request to consider the, imp the impacts of greenhouse gas emissions on uh, of proposed pipelines. So this is relatively new for the commission. We're still working out the process, but we definitely will consider cumulative emissions, uh, cumulative impacts associated with uh, pipeline projects in the same, um, proposed pipeline projects in the same area. Okay, is there anything else you could tell us about what uh, you will do to ensure that the commission's certificate policy on environmental justice reviews will be meaningful impact decision-making, so it's not just another box to check? I, and I very much appreciated that. And the reason I got interested in this subject, I actually read uh, an, an environmental impact statement associated with a proposed LNG facility in Southeast Texas. And there was a section in there on environmental justice. And, and, and basically the environmental impact statement said, well, there are only Hispanic people in this neighborhood. There aren't any other folks, uh, Caucasians or others in this particular neighborhood. So therefore there's no environmental uh, impact. There's no, there's no impact on environmental communities, environmental justice communities, which I found just outrageous. And so I started reading up more on the subject, and I realized that in our, in our particular process, how we consider or pro propose natural gas pipelines and LNG facilities, we really don't have a thorough um, process. So what I've done at the commission is I recently hired Montina Cole, who's our new senior counsel for environmental justice and equity, and she's actually putting together a team throughout the commission to address these issues to make sure that not only with regard to pipelines, but every other decision we make, we take into account the potential impact on environmental justice communities before we in fact make the final decisions. Well, thank you. I, I do know that the, the communities that are often on the front lines in these communities are communities of color, low income, disadvantaged communities, Native American communities. Um, in, in my final um, question, uh, when do you anticipate the commission will establish an updated certificate policy that takes climate change, environmental justice, and landowner rights into account. Thank you for the question again. We, uh, we are in the process of, of waiting through the comments that we have received on the notice of inquiry, uh, in, in, which is in advance of actually reformulating or revising our policy statement. My hope to do it is to do it sooner rather than later, in large part because the courts are telling us some of, some of the ways, the methodologies that we've used to determine need, for instance, to, to assess some of the other issues we consider isn't consistent with the law. So I think there's, a, there's an urgency that we feel to move forward. I can't give you a specific timeline because I need to work with my colleagues, but hopefully much sooner rather than later. All right, thank you. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I believe you're on mute, Mr. Chairman. That concludes the witness questions. And I certainly would like to thank our witnesses for your patience, for your endurance, and for your participation in today's hearing. And I, uh, at this time, remind members that pursuant to committee rules, they have 10 business days to submit additional questions for the record to be answered by the witnesses who have appeared. I ask each witness to respond promptly to any such questions that you may receive. And before we adjourn, I request unanimous consent to enter the following documents uh, into the record. Uh, 
a July 26, 21 letter from Chairman Millick and Ferk to Representative Butterfield on H.R. 3979. And uh, secondly, a news release from the Arizona Corporation Commission entitled Chairwoman Marquez Peterson alarmed by federal ruling allowing California to block energy to Arizona. With no objection, the uh, documents are entered into the record. And without uh, any more witnesses, without any more comments, the sub subcommittee now stands adjourned.